dapat po munang alamin or matukoy ang pangunahing problema ng bansa upang mapagtuunan ng pansin at mabigyan ng solusyon. We should have a specific goals, um, do research, and make a policy that is fair for everyone. Walang problema sa polisiya. Iayos lang ang pagpapatupad. Bago patubas ang batas, pag-aralan muna gusto ng government. Two things, clarity and execution. Both, you need the communication and monitoring, monitoring, monitoring. As simple as that. Mandato ng Philippine Institute for Development Studies o PIDS na gumawa ng mga pag-aaral at pananaliksik ng mga pulisiya at programa ng pamalaan at magbigay ng rekomendasyon sa mga mambabatas sa pagbabalangkas ng mga pulisiya ang makakatulong sa ating bansa. Sinusulong ng aming ahensya ang evidence-based policy making upang bigyan din ang kalaghan ng pulisiya na batay sa datos at policy research na sumusuri sa tunay na kalagayan ng ating mga komunidad. Napakalaga ng policy research, lalo na sa mga panahong dumadaan sa krisis ang ating bansa. Kapag pulisiya ay pinag-aralan, susulong ang bayan! In need of references for your research? Do you want a digital library that you can access for free anytime and anywhere? You don't have to look far. Serpy is here for you. Serpy is an online database of socioeconomic materials produced by the Philippine Institute for Development Studies. Government agencies, research and academic institutions, and international organizations based in the Philippines. It is the country's first online repository of socioeconomic information. Created for policymakers and development practitioners, researchers, educators, and students. To access SIRP, just visit the PIDS website and click the SIRP widget under the Databases tab or type SIRP-P.PIDS.gov.PA. SIRP has a wide variety of materials such as journal articles, books, research papers, working papers, policy notes, audiovisual materials, and more. As of 2022, SERPI has more than 60 partner institutions contributing knowledge resources to the database. SERPI provides a comprehensive coverage of references encompassing 22 research themes. Labor and education, gender and development, poverty, technology and innovation, trade and industry, and many more. On the enhanced website of SERPI, you can filter your research by keyword or author, publication type, research theme, or year published. All at the same time! SERPI has more than 7,000 publications and audiovisual materials that you can access and download for free. What are you waiting for? Visit SERPI now! Socioeconomic Research Portal for the Philippines Innovating Knowledge Exchange and Policy Research So what is PIDS? For over 40 years, the Philippine Institute for Development Studies or PIDS has been the country's foremost socioeconomic think tank. It conducts rigorous and objective policy research and analyses that help the government in crafting relevant policies, plans, and programs in support of the country's long-term vision and development goals. PIDS pursues its mandate through three basic programs research, dissemination, and outreach. Through its research program, PIDS identifies and prioritizes studies, develops proposals, and conducts research on priority areas. The results of these studies are then disseminated through different platforms, publications, online resources, PIDS Corner, seminars, and the Development Policy Research Month or DPRM held every September. To shed light on key policy issues, the advice and expertise of the Institute's research fellows are also sought by policymakers, government agencies, private sector, and civil society. Since 1977, PIDS has completed numerous policy studies on a wide range of development topics. 
This brand of service has then translated to policies and programs that have improved the lives of every Filipino. Philippine Institute for Development Studies, Service Through Policy Research. So what is PIDS? For over 40 years, the Philippine Institute for Development Studies or PIDS has been the country's foremost socio-economic think tank. It conducts rigorous and objective policy research and analyses that help the government in crafting relevant policies, plans, and programs in support of the country's long-term vision and development goals. PIDS pursues its mandate through three basic programs research, dissemination, and outreach. Through its research program, PIDS identifies and prioritizes studies, develops proposals, and conducts research on priority areas. The results of these studies are then disseminated through different platforms, publications, online resources, PIDS Corner, Seminars, and the Development Policy Research Month or DPRM held every September. To shed light on key policy issues, the advice and expertise of the Institute's research fellows are also sought by policymakers, government agencies, private sector, and civil society. Since 1977, PIDS has completed numerous policy studies on a wide range of development topics. This brand of service has then translated to policies and programs that have improved the lives of every Filipino. Philippine Institute for Development Studies, Service Through Policy Research. Dapat po munang alamin or matukoy ang pangunahing problema ng bansa upang mapagtuunan ng pansin at mabigyan ng solusyon. We should have a specific goals, um, do research, and make a policy that is fair for everyone. Walang problema sa polisiya. Iayos lang ang pagpapatupad. Bago patubas ang batas, pag-aralan muna gusto ng government. Two things, clarity and execution. Both, you need the communication, and monitoring, monitoring, monitoring. As simple as that. Mandato ng Philippine Institute for Development Studies, o PIDS, na gumawa ng mga pag-aaral at pananaliksik ng mga pulisiya at programa ng pamalaan at magbigay ng rekomendasyon sa mga mambabatas sa pagbabalangkas ng mga pulisiya ang makakatulong sa ating bansa. Sinusulong ng aming ahensya ang evidence-based policy making upang bigyan din ang kalagahan ng polisiya na batay sa datos at policy research na sumusuri sa tunay na kalagayan ng ating mga komunidad. Napakahalaga ng policy research, lalo na sa mga panahong dumadaan sa krisis ang ating bansa. Kapag polisiya ay pinag-aralan, susulong ang bayan! In need of references for your research? Do you want a digital library that you can access for free anytime and anywhere? You don't have to look far. Serpy is here for you. Serpy is an online database of socioeconomic materials produced by the Philippine Institute for Development Studies. Government agencies, research and academic institutions, and international organizations based in the Philippines. It is the country's first online repository of socioeconomic information. Created for policymakers and development practitioners, researchers, educators, and students. To access SIRP, just visit the PIDS website and click the SIRP widget under the Databases tab or type SIRP p.pids.gov.pa. SIRP has a wide variety of materials such as journal articles, books, research papers, working papers 
policy notes, audiovisual materials, and more. As of 2022, SERPI has more than 60 partner institutions contributing knowledge resources to the database. SERPI provides a comprehensive coverage of references encompassing 22 research themes. Labor and Education, Gender and Development, Poverty, Technology and Innovation, Trade and Industry, and many more. On the enhanced website of SERPI, you can filter your research by keyword or author, publication type, research theme, or year published. All at the same time! SERPI has more than 7,000 publications and audiovisual materials that you can access and download for free. What are you waiting for? Visit SERPI now! Social Economic Research Portal for the Philippines Innovating Knowledge Exchange and Policy Research Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the PIDS webinar series, where we feature our policy studies and the insights of government policymakers and program implementers, industry experts and practitioners, scholars, and civil society actors. Through this virtual interactive series, PIDS hopes to provide an accessible venue 
for evidence-based discussion of current and emerging development issues. I'm Sheila CR and I will be your moderator. To kick off this series, this 2023, we will talk about the country's macroeconomic outlook for the year. So how will the Philippine economy fare in 2023 amid uh, domestic and global challenges? And what should be done to help the country steer through economic uncertainties? Well, those are the questions that we will try to answer this afternoon through our guest speakers. To formally start our conversation and give us more details about today's webinar, may I call on the president of PIDS, Dr. Aniceto Arbeta Jr. Sir? Good afternoon uh, and welcome to our public webinar on macroeconomic prospects of the Philippines in 2023. First, allow me to acknowledge the presence of the following officials, Asian Development Bank Alternate Director, Dr. Justin Yukno Sikat, and Senior Economist, Juthin Jinjara, uh, USAID Senior Economic Growth Specialist, Jan Avila, Australian Embassy First Secretary, Simon Reed, International Labor Organization Senior Employment Specialist Ku Yun, BARM Ministry of Finance and Budget and Management Director Attorney Amira Pindatun, Cooperative Development Authority Deputy Administrator Ri Ilevasa, uh, Miriam College President Laura Del Rosario, Siliman University Vice President for Development Jen, uh, Jane Annette Pilarmino. I would like to greet uh, the various representatives of the government, academe, private sector, civil society, media, and virtually present today, and those watching through PIDS and SRP Facebook pages. In 2022, uh, the Philippine economy grew by 7.6% uh, as reported in the Philippine Statistics Authority. Uh, it marks a significant improvement from the contraction experience in 2020 uh, due to the pandemic. However, Accompanying this growth is a rising inflation rate that reached 8.1% in December 2022. Food inflation is even higher at 10.6%, a 9% increase from 1.6% inflation rate in December 2021. In January 2023, the inflation rate further soared to 8.7%. The fast rising inflation has reduced the purchasing power of households and businesses, uh, forcing them to find ways to survive amid news of the depreciating peso, rising gas prices, housing rental, electricity, water, food, and the more recent uh, being onions and eggs. Moreover, the threat of another global recession looms as experts warn that major economies may take a downturn soon, leaving investors and business, businesses cautious with government trying to spur economic growth. Fortunately, we are starting the year well. The Department of Finance reported that our debt to GDP uh, ratio has since last from, from a 17 year high of 63.7% in the third quarter of 2022 to 60.9% by the end of the same year. This development is good news as it indicates stabilizing economy that's good for investment, better financing options and an environment favorable for growth and expansion. Given these challenges and opportunities, we assess, we assess the current uh, state of the Philippine economy and identify policy priorities and proposals for a more robust economy in 2023. Today's presentation will help us evaluate the country's macroeconomic performance from 2021 to 2022 and see what lies ahead. The study Macroeconomic prospects of the Philippines in 2023 steering critical. Through Global Headwinds, authored by PIDS Senior Research Fellow Margarita de Boque Gonzalez, Supervising Research Specialist Jan Paul Corpus, and Research Analyst Ramona Maria Miral, reviewed the Philippine macroeconomic performance in 2021 to 2022 and analyzed recent developments and challenges shaping the economy's outlook for 2023. We will also hear from the representatives of government agencies and the private sector actively working for a vibrant economy. We have invited the Department of Finance uh, Assistant Chief Economic Counselor, mm -hmm. Director Marcus Oliva, to share the department's initiative to help the countries steer through uh, the economic and fiscal risks. Fellow discussants Rafael Alfonso Manalili, an economist from the Bank of the Philippine Islands Global Market Segment, and Mr. Rubin Pascual, Secretary General of the Philippine Chamber 
to commerce and industry will also offer responses and insights. We are grateful to have you in this webinar. To our attendees, thank you for choosing to spend your afternoon with us. We hope our webinars will provide information and insights that will prove helpful in your endeavors. I encourage you to participate openly uh, in the open forum activity. Thank you. And I'll give back the floor to our moderator, Sheila. Thank you, Dr. Urbeta. Well, just uh, some reminders for joining the discussion. So you may post your questions and comments using uh, the Q&A button. Uh, I repeat, please use, use the Q&A button, not uh, the chat box. Please indicate your name and organization if you want to be identified when I uh, read out the questions. Um, to all speakers, you may respond by typing your answers, which will be visible to all attendees. Alternatively, you can choose to answer the question live during the open forum. For our uh, live stream viewers on Facebook, we highly encourage you to participate as well. So please use the comment section on Facebook for your questions. We will accommodate as many questions as possible that are relevant to the discussion during the open forum. Okay, so let us begin our conversation by listening to our featured presentation, which is the PIDS study titled Macroeconomic Prospects of the Philippines in 2022-2023, Steering Through Global Headwinds, authored by Dr. Margarita de Boque Gonzalez, uh, Mr. John uh, Paul Carpus, and Ms. Uh, Ramona Mural. Dr. Um, Margarita or Maggie Gonzalez will give the presentation. Dr. Gonzalez specializes in monetary, financial, and macroeconomics. And before joining PIDS as a senior research fellow, she was an associate professor at the University of the Philippine School of Economics, where she headed the Financial and International Economics Committee and the Union Bank Center for Financial and Monetary Economics. She also previously served as a consultant to various uh, government agencies and international financial institutions, and was country advisor for several years at Global Source Partners, which oversees an international network of independent economists. Maggie used to be a regular contributor at the business section of the Philippine Daily Inquirer. She obtained her PhD in economics from the UP School of Economics and her, and her uh, Bachelor of Science in Psychology also from UP. Dr. Uh, Gonzalez, Maggie, the floor is now yours. Uh, hello, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be presenting to you today. Thank you, Sheila, for the generous and very kind introduction. Uh, thank you, President Arbeta and our panelists for taking time out of your busy schedules to be part of this webinar. Today, I'm going to present our take on the macro prospects of the Philippines this year, 2023, and since last year marked a change in political leadership, we are also presenting what we believe ought to be some of the policy priorities of the new government. So throwing in our two cents worth on that as well. My co-authors again are John Paul Corpus and Ramona Maria Miral. Um, so can we have the slide on please? Can, I, um, can we see the slide? Um, I'm sorry, I cannot see the slide. Okay. Okay. So again, this is uh, um, the first, uh, actually the first chapter of the PIDS Economic Policy Monitor, which is one of the flagship publications of the P of PIDS. The theme this year being hashtag close the gap, accelerate post pandemic recovery through social justice. So before I present, I would just like to state the usual disclaimer. For the forecast and analysis that we are presenting, these are ultimately the opinions of myself and my co-authors, assuming they agree with me, of course, and not necessarily of PIDS as a whole. So let me show you first uh, the presentation outline. Um, next slide, please. So first, we will be discussing the macro performance of the Philippines in uh, the past couple of years, 21, 2021, and 2022. Then we'll look at the macro conditions going into 2023, the new year. 
Then we will look at the macro outlook for this year and followed by a discussion of the limiting factors, the risks and challenges faced by the economy. And finally, our own take on what should be done or what can be done uh, in steering through these global headwinds that we will also discuss in, during the presentation. Next slide, please. So first part, uh, what was the macro performance in 21, 22? So we know exactly what happened now. Um, so we know that in 2020, we had a, a deep recession. So if you look at the first graph, that's uh, the red bar uh, because of the pandemic. And we have been recovering since then. Um, we grew by 5.7% in 2021 and uh, a stronger than expected uh, growth of 7.6% in 2022, thanks um, to the lifting of pandemic restrictions and the rise in vaccinations and the revival thereof of public mobility. So on the spending side, we know that the resurgence was seen in the largest component of aggregate demand, which is household consumption, accounting for about 70%. So that's the yellow bar in the middle graph. So we see a resurgence in the yellow bar, which is consumption, and the resurgence in the orange bar, which is investment. On the production side, uh, the recovery was seen again in the most uh, badly hit sector, which was services. So that's the yellow bar. And support also coming from a revival in uh, industrial output, which is the gray bar. Next slide, please. Okay, so the reopening um, also um, featured uh, uh, a recovery in the employment sector. So the economic uh, reopening improved labor market conditions. So again, um, we saw um, the worst uh, during the pandemic. So we had uh, unemployment rising to as high as I think 17.6%. And underemployment as high as 18.9% in uh, in uh, April of 2020, and labor force participation rising to around uh, sorry falling to around 55.7% during the same period. But again, there we have seen a recovery there. Labor force participation has gone back um, to pre-pandemic uh, levels. At, uh, in fact, above pre-pandemic levels. And unemployment has also normalized, gone back to pre-pandemic levels, although uh, underemployment uh, remains elevated. So we saw another surge in unemployment, underemployment, sorry, in July 2021. It has since come down and uh, still uh, uh, hovers around 14.2% in October of 2022. Next slide, please. So the biggest, uh, Next slide, please. So the biggest story was really inflation. Okay, the, the past two years, the biggest story was inflation. So inflation uh, reached 3.9% uh, in 2021. That's uh, from the rebased uh, index. But uh, the, the initial print there was about 4.4%, which is above um, the target. And the Inflation story then was uh, in 2021 was really dominated by food prices, so mainly higher meat prices due to the African swine, swine fever and higher energy prices as demand for energy rebounded globally from the pandemic. And the inflation story continued in 2022. Uh, again, we know the story there, there inflation began to climb due to uh, the Russian Ukraine, uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine, that conflict led to geopolitical tensions, which led to higher, uh, contributed to higher energy prices and higher world food prices. Okay, so, that, so um, and then it continued uh, until today, uh, notably in the prices of, of vegetables and, um, and utilities. So the BSP uh, was able to maintain the policy rate at 2% uh, throughout 2021 and most of 2022, but it, uh, it eventually had to contain rising inflation. And so the policy rate was hiked seven times, actually from May 2022 to January 2023 by a total of 3.5 percentage points. So from 2% to 5.5%. So there was uh, monetary tightening um, next slide, please. The other major story of the year 
was uh, the, the currency story. So the Philippine peso weakened against the U.S. dollar beginning mid-2021 uh, and until 2022. Uh, simultaneous is that we saw the current account, uh, we saw it uh, go into a surplus, remember, in April, uh, in, sorry, in 2020, and mainly because imports were falling uh, faster than exports, so we had a surplus, and that has swung back to a deficit and continues to be in a def deficit. At the same time, um, the U.S. rate, uh, the U.S. policy rates were being hiked by the U.S. Uh, Fed uh, in their bid to fight inflation, and so the aggressive tightening of the Fed uh, led to a, a narrowing of the gap between um, local and uh, U.S. policy rates, so Philippine and U.S. policy rates. So that uh, is how it looked in 2021 and 2022. And so what are the macro conditions going forward? Next slide, please. So the macroeconomic uh, conditions going into uh, 2023. Um, so there are uh, several major main threads. One is uh, a slowing of major economies. So um, there was uh, a revision substantial uh, downward revision of growth forecasts for advanced economies, notably for U.S., Japan, and key countries in the euro area. The U.S. last year posted two consecutive quarter-on-quarter -quarter GDP declines during the first half of 2022, with growth remaining weak until the year end. But there's a, there's a positive lining because the U.S. labor market remains relatively tight. So there's relatively um, um, still... Um, some growth there, you can see some growth there. And then uh, in China, on the other hand, uh, they also fell to a historic low of 0.4% annually last year in Q2 2022, rebounded uh, three point, by 3.9% by in Q3, but weakened again to Q4. So um, seems like uh, you know a very somber story, but uh, especially with the real uh, estate crisis uh, adding to the negative outlook. But again, there's a positive uh, uh, shimmer of hope there because they have let go of their zero COVID uh, policy regime. And so that is expected to um, fuel optimism, okay? So in fact, in the markets, uh, markets lately have actually been very optimistic, with, especially with the pronouncements of the Fed, uh, and uh, yeah, of, with, uh, with China's uh, abandonment of their zero COVID strategy. Next slide, please. So the other uh, major thread is um, still inflation, unfortunately. So inflation has become a major concern across countries, leading to monetary tightening globally. So if you look at the first graph, you can see that uh, the story that we told earlier uh, is there. We have a surge in global oil and food prices, especially following the Russian invasion of Ukraine uh, beginning February last year. But this uh, peaked in Q2 2022. And actually, uh, the good news is it actually has been softening. So global oil and food prices have been slowing down. Okay, so um, that being said, higher food and energy prices uh, are still seen all over the world. Uh, aggregate demand is stoking inflation across the world. So there are countries where um, inflation remains to be high and where central banks are therefore responding by hiking interest rates. And uh, this basically uh, ends the, the period of easing monetary policy that prevailed since the start of the pandemic. The next slide, please. The other major thread that we see uh, that uh, we have our own financial conditions index. This is uh, a, 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 an index that I developed together with uh, Dr. Gachaco Bautista of the UP School of Economics. And uh, the, the thing that we have to watch out for is that financial conditions in the country have actually worsened uh, already in line with tightening monetary policy and higher domestic currency risk. And it has gone into negative territory. Um, and the last reading was in mid-2022. And we know that there was further monetary tightening during the time and further um, currency volatility during the time. So 
likely gone down further. And so that is uh, sort of the warning sign that we should be looking at. However, um, this is uh, a world where, you know, a very uh, VUCA world, as they say. So there is also uh, a positive uh, indicator that we see. So there's uh, the, uh, in terms of high frequency indicators, the PMI is also one indicator that's uh, sort of very useful. And we see PMIs actually going up. Uh, uh, in November, uh, as of November of 2022. So what does that mean? It means that there is, uh, this still suggests further economic ex expansion because this index considers variables such as business output, new orders and uh, exports and readings above 50 suggest expansion. And clearly we are above 50 and the PMI is rising. Okay, so two pictures that uh, seem to say uh, different, indicate different things. Okay, so next slide, please. Um, another um, um, thing, thread that we are uh, looking at, uh, another theme is really uh, the demand for loans have been growing. So that's a good sign, despite tightening of monetary policy. If you look at the first graph, if you see the red line, there's a very sharply rising line and that's really the line for household consumption loads. Okay, so household consumption, uh, borrowings for household consumption has been rising. If you look at the third graph to the right, um, that is especially true for salary loans and credit card loans. So yeah, you could look at, positive, look at it possibly pos positively or negatively, but the thing is it is rising and it has been fueling household consumption. And the, the question of course is, is it going to continue? In terms of production uh, loans, um, there is growth and especially in areas, sectors of the economy where we expect to find it, which is information uh, and communication given uh, uh, the need uh, for such during the pandemic. It also has been rising for manufacturing, which is also, again, an optimistic sign. Next slide, please. Uh, so this is just a flashback because this is what we usually look at before during the pandemic, because the main restriction to growth there was really mobility restriction. So this is just to reiterate that mobility has recovered. Okay, the restrictions have been removed and we are slowly going back to not really going back, but at least uh, people are now going out in recreation and retail. If you look at the right uh, graph, right side graph, you can see that mobility has gone up for recreation and retail. Although people are still say, staying at home, um, we do see them now going out of their houses. Um, next slide, please. And finally, um, another sort of more subdued uh, thread is really that fiscal policy has become less expansionary. So that's what we're seeing based on the government's medium-term fiscal program. Spending is actually set to grow by less than 3% in 2023. And fiscal, and this is really part, I think the DOF uh, representative will explain to us that uh, maybe part of their consolidation already as they hope to bring the budget deficit from 8.6% of GDP in 2021 to um, 3% of GDP in 2028. Um, I think now it's around uh, minus 6.9% uh, of GDP. Uh, and so the fiscal consolidation story is starting to show and the hope is, uh, this is uh, supporting their hope to bring debt to GDP um, ratio, the debt to, debt to GDP ratio to below 60% by 2025 from the projected peak of 61.8% in 2022. So I think 22, uh, 2022, the figure for, for 2022 already came in. It was, I think, 60.9% as uh, reported by our president, um, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Arbeta. Um, remember also that we were also the team that uh, forecasted debt to GDP ratio. And we actually forecasted debt uh, the debt ratio to be around 63% this year. And it was 63% in the middle of the year. But we also emphasize that the uptick 
from pre-pandemic to 2020, uh, six percentage points of that was actually due to government building up cash. So as we said, there was a 6% uh, leeway for, for our treasurer, for our for the national government. So yeah, so um, that's for the conditions going into uh, 2023. We now look at uh, the macro outlook. So ito na yon, tandadaan. Okay, so uh, what's our macro outlook? Um, can we flash our macro outlook page? Okay, so I think this is everyone, what everyone is waiting for. So before I discuss why our macro outlook is like that, I first uh, would like to sort of report how we have performed uh, in the past in terms of forecasting. Um, so we usually forecast every October. Okay, so, um, so there's a slight information advantage versus the other institutions. Um, so, um, um, so we forecast around October uh, and then we forecast for the year and for the next year. Okay, so in 2020, October 2020, so we have the first half results in. So we know the first half results. So October 2020, actually September 2020 is when we start forecasting. And uh, the forecasting method we use, I think this is important for those the technical people who are watching, we're using our FCI and we're following the Bernanke approach, uh, continuing again the paper uh, from what I did with, uh, in my paper with Dr. Uh, Bautista. And uh, we use that to forecast ahead. Okay, so for 2020, we forecasted minus 9.5. So first, anayon, beginner's luck, it was actually minus 9.5. So we forecasted that around October 2020. So the ones in parentheses, our year forward forecast, meaning for 2021, the figures in parentheses were forecasted in October 2020. So in October 2020, for 2021, for example, we forecasted 6%. Okay, and, every, and we were like in the middle because the most pessimistic then was World Bank, 5.3%. And then, of course, government was 6.5 to 7.5%. And then the, the COVID continued. We had uh, Delta waves, et cetera. And so all the forecasts were brought down and they're brought down to around uh, four, between 45%. We brought it a little bit. Uh, so na sobrahan. So we brought it down to 5.4%, and the actual number was 5.7%. Okay. So again, in uh, the same thing for 2022, in October 2021, we forecasted GDP growth of 6.5% for 2022. So um, so we were rather on the optimistic side. Government was in seven to nine percent. We were below government, but we are still optimistic. I think at six point five, along with the private sector. Um, and then again, uh, there was a continuous stream of information, and we saw that the numbers were surprising on the high side, and so we pushed it up to seven point one percent, thinking that you know inflation will somehow temper the number. But again, the revival story was very strong. Um, the reopening story was very strong. And of course, now looking back, uh, we should have known that it was because even our own lives, we've witnessed it. We did a lot of catch-up catch spending uh, when the economy is reopened. And so the actual was 7.6%. So still not a bad forecast. Um, so for this year, for the coming year, we are penciling in uh, between 45 to 5.5%. Okay, so this is uh, lower uh, than government. I'll explain why it's lower based on my conversations with government, people, uh, forecasters from government. So they're forecasting 6.5 to 8%. We're forecasting 4.5 to 5% based on the, the threads I, I talked about earlier, the themes I talked about earlier. Um, basically the external headwinds and, and the inflation story, uh, et cetera. And then, uh, so we're sort of now on the pessimistic end. Uh, we're about the same as with the IMF uh, and the World Bank, uh, maybe lower than the World Bank. Uh, on the optimistic end, it's the government and ADB uh, and uh, 
um, the private sector, focused economics, by the way, is the private sector average. They're around 5.7%. Now, the reason why we have a lower uh, than government, because when I talked to the forecasters of government, they said they were penciling in investment, um, investment surge, uh, which they anticipate because of the CREATE law and the lowering uh, of the taxes, which uh, should invite in investment. Okay, so that's ma mainly where we differ, I think. So next slide, please. For inflation, for inflation, um, again, same story. Uh, we did quite well, 2020, 2021. So 2.6% forecast versus 2.6 actual. This is prior to rebasing. I'm bringing it back to bringing it back to prior rebasing, because that's how that's the series that we use in forecasting. So that eventually became 2.4 percent, I think. So depending on, on which index you use, either we're we're not the ones who are correct, or we are the ones uh, that are correct. For 2021, uh, again, not bad. Uh, 2022, not bad. So this year, uh, I guess this is the number people would like to know. We have penciled in 3.5 to 4.5%, but we do have to say that uh, it, we may revise it uh, depending on ha what happens in the next of, of the following months. Uh, okay, but the 8.6% in January is already a sign of where the headline inflation is going to land by the end of the year because the way we measure it is really a year on year year and it's a yearly average okay so um next slide please so what are the limiting factors uh risks and challenges so i'll just go this quick uh, through this quickly um the one is high inflation so higher consumer prices have reduced the purchasing power of households while higher input costs are pressuring businesses, especially those with, with already thin margins and low net worth. And this may continue to dampen private consumption and investment appetite. We are also looking at the business environment, which has become more challenging due to higher financing and business costs and economic uncertainty. Businesses are still recovering from the pandemic and may be more cautious given the new political leadership and recent reforms to liberalize investment may take time to bear fruit. The final limiting factor is the policy space to counter an economic slowdown. The central bank is constrained to keep monetary policy tight to fight inflation. Meanwhile, the rise in deficits and public debt due to the, to the pandemic has pressed the government to pursue fiscal consolidation. Next slide, please. So there are a number of risks. Um, so. Um, there's some might say there's no such thing as an upside risk, so I'll change that to upside potential because risk now is something that you anticipate that is not wanted. So we talk about upside potentials and downside risks. The upside is there is an upside, so we're not all negative, and there's actually potential for a strong upside, especially if what the government forecasters are anticipating will happen is if inv investments come in. Another upside is the still resilient remittances. Okay, so most of the forecasters in government and in the private sector always look at this. And we always try to find hope in it because in the global financial crisis, remittances managed to stay strong despite the global downturn. So that is what we are hoping for, resilient remittances and resilient BPO receipts. Okay, uh, BPO receipts may remain strong. By the way, um, remittances may remain, remain strong because of the demand for health care workers because of the pandemic also. And BPO receipts similarly may remain strong in a post-pandemic world given the need for digital workers. Okay, so those are the positive um, things that we uh, hope will happen. And of course, there's the possible revival of tourism. So why are we looking at tourism? Um, so mainly because we're ha only just halfway from where we were before. Prior to pandemic, we were around at 800,000 tourist, tourist arrivals. 800,000 by uh, in December 2019. Last December, it was only 400,000 thereabouts. Okay, so a lot of space. And if 
China is, you know, opening it up and other countries are opening up, then there is a, an upside there um, for, uh, for the private sector. The other upside is the um, commodity prices have actually started to decline. So that's an upside. Uh, the downside, uh, I don't want to reiterate, but it have to, but there's the drop in global financial conditions, possible recession still in the US, maybe no longer in China. Um, and then there's uh, the continuing conflict that hopefully will end between Russia and Ukraine. Next slide, please. And um, so finally, um, the last thing that, uh, and most important thing, uh, the biggest challenge of the government is economic scarring from pandemic. So I am like already a broken record. I keep talking about this in every article I write. It's really the economic scarring that we have to reverse. Many sectors of the economy have suffered enduring business uh, losses, human capital losses due to closures of firms and the unemployment uh, during the lockdowns and restrictions, the mobility restrictions. So output in some sectors are still below pre-pandemic levels. I think that is one thing uh, we are very worried about. There must be new areas of growth to help bring the economy to its pre-pandemic path. If you look at the first graph, um, the scarring, the, the visual representation of that is if you imagine a line protruding from where growth uh, where GDP was, uh, GDP was in 2019. So if you imagine a line there, that is where we should have been if the COVID-19 had not happened. And so the crater that is created, if you imagine that line and the UCA, the crater, the UCA in the graph, that is the representation of the scarring, uh, which suggests that there may have been diminution of capital both business and human capital that has to be addressed. In the industrial sector, industrial sector, you can see that in construction, you can see that in manufacturing, in the services sector, which is the most affected by the pandemic, it's most obvious in uh, accommodation and food, very obvious also in transportation and storage, uh, also in real estate, et cetera. So these, these things, uh, so, uh, growth has to come from from new areas in order for, for uh, the economy to, to be propelled into a higher growth path. So um, for the last part, uh, we just like to reiterate some of the policy priorities. We think some of the things gov we think government should prioritize. Okay, so this is really just a reminder that there ought to be a good uh, government uh, uh, so ought to be good macro management. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide, please. Okay, policy priorities and proposals. So um, one is really a reminder for good uh, macro management. Um, so continued good macro management. Sorry if I'm if I if I'm uh, I, I might get misunderstood, but it's really just continued uh, good uh, macro management. Uh, one is to control inflation without harming growth. So inflation must be controlled as it creates instability and worsens poverty. But this should, this should be done without stifling the recovery. So again, carefully calibrated responses and a coherent public communication strategy. Higher, we suggest higher frequency surveys on household and business expectations, which can help with early de detection of inflation risk. So the BSP has done a very good job already on that. And, and we look forward to, uh, to more monitoring um, to help cushion the effects of inflation on poor households. Um, we hope there will be targeted support for these households rather than price controls or untargeted subsidies. By the way, these, this was written again in October of 2022. So much of this has already been addressed, um, but. Uh, still, we would like to reiterate. So another, aside from the demand side uh, um, correction to inflation, uh, we also encourage looking at the supply side, which again is being done by government uh, today, and uh, looking at reforms that could raise productivity to lower inflation in the long run, investment in education, in infrastructure, in the more media, uh, immediate term, 
uh, removal of supply cons constraints that may be adding to inflation or fueling in in inflation, uh, such as easing import restrictions when needed. So again, we have the various EOs addressing um, pork, rice, uh, extend, extended to um, tar uh, tariffs on imported cord and coal, et cetera. So all these measures that temporarily uh, are um, um, reducing the tariffs to mitigate the inflation pressures. Next slide, please. Another uh, thing we would like just to um, highlight is uh, smoothening of exchange rate volatility because sharp depreciation may make the fight against inflation more difficult. It may harm balance sheets of firms and it heightens business uncertainty. However, we also remind, try, want to sort of reiterate that policy responses should also depend on the nature of the exchange rate movement. If depreciation is because of fundamental factors and financial markets are stable, then once, uh, one simply has to adjust monetary policy to keep within inflation targets and allow the exchange rate to serve its purpose as an automatic shock absorber. However, uh, temporary exchange rate interventions may be warranted when the market disturbances uh, are in danger of triggering financial or macroeconomic stability. Okay, so that's again, um, just a helpful reminder. Um, next slide, please. Um, we also um, would just like to reiterate the reminder to pursue fiscal sustainability while keeping um, being mindful of what is happening to the vulnerable sectors of society. So pursuing fiscal sustainability, but protecting those at risk. So while fiscal space must be rebuilt, the government should protect those suffering from elevated inflation and the pandemic's lingering effects, targeted again support to Poor households can provide relief without undermining fiscal targets. To foster credibility, the medium-term medium -term fiscal framework should provide specifics on public spending prioritization, future legislative, legislative measures in terms of size and sufficiency of new revenue sources, and most especially the timing of these um, fiscal reforms. Um, another reminder, the Mandana's Garcia ruling has added uncertainty to the government's spending plans. So we again call for greater clarity on policy implementation before moving ahead with full devolution. Again, this was written in October of 2022, and it has been addressed. addressed and actually, uh, the time allotted for the devolution has already been extended. Uh, from 2024 to 2027 to give our local governments more time uh, for the change, uh, to adjust to the change. Um, next slide, please. Um, and then there's also, given the external headwinds, there's a need to prepare for financial tightening and uncertainty. These are the things that we tend to forget, but it's useful to remind because with global financial tightening, uh, spillovers to emerging markets are likely, and the Philippines is one uh, emerging market, and this can multiply financial risks. So again, just a call for our regulators to stay vigilant of threats to financial stability through close monitoring of banks. And actually, all the indicators are okay uh, just yet uh, today. I think we saw NPLs go uh, reported going down and capital adequacy indicators remaining high and comfortable at comfortable levels. But there's also uh, going beyond banks, there should also be monitoring of conglomerates that are associated with banks, including offshore and foreign currency borrowing of non-financial firms. Uh, we raised this, this has been raised by the World Bank, mentioning the Philippines as being among the vulnerable to exchange rate depreciations with at least uh, three-fifths of maturing debt uh, consisting of syndicated loans and bonds denominated in foreign currency. Okay, so just a helpful reminder on that. To preserve financial stability, the central bank could consider using its powers to gather information from broad sectors and close, therefore close important data gaps. Okay, the financial regulators have already embraced a macro prudential framework so we uh, we cheer that effort. So we encourage that there be continued monitoring of financial risk from a macroprudential perspective, 
for instance, through some sort of macro scenario stress test. Okay, so that's something that we are looking forward to seeing uh, being done by our uh, regulators. Next slide, please. So, um, so this is the second la to the last uh, recommendation. And this is again, our broken record theme, which is really uh, address the pandemic star scars. It cannot be uh, overstated that the productivity losses from the COVID-19 crisis has to be reversed. Uh, one immediate way uh, to do this is just to continue uh, prioritization of infrastructure spending because this helps address scarring by enhancing physical capital of uh, the country. It, uh, of course, boosts long-term growth, while at, at the same time also boosting short-term growth through the short-run multiplier effects. So high potential areas include infrastructure for more efficient trade, better digital connectivity, and clean energy, especially where private sector participation is viable, with a caveat that financial risk to government remain carefully controlled. And again, the government should also continue human capital investments in education, learning losses during the pandemic, very deep. I mean, in our households, those of us who are mothers, we know exactly what this means uh, because for how many years we had to live with online learning and we know that's not enough. And so there has to be some way, especially among public schools, to reverse those losses. And there's, we saw how the need, the importance of efficient social protection delivery. So again, continued efforts on that. We've already started to digitize that. So we should go on with that. And continued investment in public health care. And again, the reason is obvious because we do not want to go to an, through another uh, COVID-19 pandemic type regime again, uh, where we had to, uh, uh, to lock down the economy. Uh, just to uh, keep going. Okay. So lastly, and I think this is where I think we we also place full emphasis on, there should be continued policy uh, and momentum on investments. So I'm very glad that we're now have I'm now using the past tense rather than the present tense with one of the strict strictest sorry regulatory regimes. For, the, uh, for foreign direct investment in Southeast Asia, the Philippines had perennially lagged its neighbors in attracting FDI. And I'm using had because there's good news. There's a fortunately here. Fortunately, the past administration has left us with laws that have loosened long standing restrictions to the FDI, boosting the, boosting the country's investment competitiveness. Okay, so we know these laws, these are the amendment of the Retail Trade Act of 2000. Uh, so we've relaxed restrictions on foreign participation in the retail trade area sector. Then there's uh, the amendment of the 1991 Foreign Investment Act. The RA numbers are on the slide. So this allows for greater foreign participation in micro and small scale enterprises. And then finally, uh, the most important of, uh, the more important, uh, well, I, let's not rank it. One of the important reforms was the amendment of the Public Service Act of 1936, which enables uh, full foreign ownership in public services that are not public utilities or critical uh, infrastructure. Okay, so the government uh, should continue to remove impediments to FDI. And the usual complaint list that they have to address, it's been there and it's uh, you know written down in the in the, in the websites of the foreign in, uh, investment uh, um, uh, related to foreign investment, and these include inadequate infrastructure, expensive power, slow internet connectivity, regulatory inconsistencies, and concerns about government corruption. In a latest, in the, la in the latest uh, CEO survey, there was uh, they had a survey on what they think are the top risks uh, to a recovery, and they highlighted corruption as one of them. And so I guess that is where um, some uh, the effort should be focused on. So summing up, macro outlook in 2023, steering through global headwinds in uh, 2023. This has been challenging. 
there's going to be challenging times for the Philippine economy and the rest of the world. Economic growth in the Philippines will likely moderate, but there are positive surprises that are possible. So let's not lose hope. There's remittances, there's tourism, there's BPOs, and hopefully a lot more. Um, we have to live with inflation through the year. It may be elevated, uh, mainly because of the um, we're dealing with year-on-year -year inflation, and January was already high, so likely to be high until the middle of the year. So we can expect inflation to fall, hopefully by the middle of the year. Okay. So policy recommendations just continue pers uh, to pursue balanced macro management. I hope our man economic managers keep their eye on the ball. I think that's my message. Keep the eye on the ball. Uh, really um, stable management. That is what we, we should be uh, concentrating on now. Um, and then address the pandemic scars. Also another uh, thing we should be laser focused on. Drop everything else and manage the economy well. And then continue policy uh, momentum on investments, particularly FDI. Okay, thank you very much for listening. That was a, a very hard presentation to make. And yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. D um, Gonzalez, Maggie, for that um, comprehensive and enlightening presentation. Uh, you did very well. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you for sharing your assessment of the previous year's uh, economic performance, your forecast for the year, and also your recommended policy priorities and um, proposals to help help the country steer through the headwinds. No, as what uh, Dr. Uh, Gonzalez mentioned, uh, we should focus on what what should be um, what we need. No. What should be done? No, focus on the ball. What should be done to um, help the country steer through the the headwinds? And she gave us um, her recommended uh, policy priorities and proposals. We can unpack uh, those uh, priorities and proposals later during the open forum. But for those who are um, uh, asking if we will share a copy of the presentation, yes, we will uh, later after the webinar and for those who are interested to uh, get hold of uh, the full study, um, please uh, go to our website, tids.gov.ph uh, for a copy of the full paper. So yes, um, as what she mentioned, there were bright spots, but uh, well, there are still a lot of major concerns affecting our country, such as the slowing down of the major economies. She also mentioned about soaring inflation, worsening fish, fish, uh, financial conditions, etc. Okay. Now, uh, before we listen to uh, uh, the reactions and insights of our guests, let's pause for a while and know the pulse of our audience through a poll. And everyone joining us on Zoom and Facebook is welcome to join our poll. So here is our poll question. And we hope um, you'll participate, okay? Do you think things will turn for the better by mid-year of 2023? Yes or no? So to answer um, uh, our poll question, please click the Mentimeter link available on the uh, Zoom chat box and also um, in the Facebook comment section. So I hope that you're able to, uh, to um, access the Mentimeter link, just go to, uh, just open the Zoom chat box, or if you're watching on Facebook, just um, um, click uh, the link on uh, Facebook, uh, the comment section on Facebook. So can we now look at the results on Mentimeter as you, as, as we receive answers to this question? Okay, can mm -hmm. we look now at, this, at the, um, the results on the screen? Okay, okay, so it looks like there's more. Okay, so it appears that uh, despite our difficulties, um, optimism still in the air, more webinar participants uh, think things will improve by, by the year's second half. So, well, this is very important as this positive outlook will see us through tough times. Okay. 
Right. Okay. So thank you very much for um, participating in our poll. So at this point, let us listen to the reactions and insights of our discussions. And we are honored to have with us this afternoon three experts. Our first discussant is Director Marites Oliva, uh, the Assistant Chief um, Economic uh, Counselor at the Department of Finance. Director Oliva um, conducts some macroeconomic uh, surveillance and provides inputs for financial fiscal uh, policy recommendations, formulates tax uh, reform proposals, and provides forecasts of national government revenues. Before her appointment at the Finance Department, she served as Bank Officer 6 at the Banco Central ng Pilipinas Research Academy. She also served as a technical staff of the Advisory Committee that reviews and recommends monetary policy stands to the BSP Monetary Board. She obtained her Master of Arts degree in economics from the University of the Philippines School of Economics and her Master's in Public Policy degree from the Hitotsubashi University in Tokyo, Japan. Uh, Director Oliva, uh, the floor is now yours. Ms. Um, Hello, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for inviting us, um, uh, particularly um, being one of the discussants of the paper of um, the, Dr. Maggie and the rest. Thank you so much for giving us this opportunity. So I'll just share first my uh, presentation. Uh, can you see my slide now? Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Well, um, again, thank you for inviting the Department of Finance as one of the discussants. Um, as always, we at the national government uh, benefit from the studies of the that are being conducted by our economists and um, experts at the PIDS. We find them very important in improving our work, particularly when it comes to policy formulation. Uh, let me share with you the latest from the perspective of the national government on our initial plans on how to maintain our economy's resilience against global economic headwinds. I think um, this was thoroughly discussed by Dr. Maggie. As you know, the Philippine economy increased by 7.6% uh, for, uh, for the full year of 2022. This is above the 6.5 to 7.5% assumption of the Development Budget Coordination Committee and also much better compared to the projections of other uh, market analysts and multilaterals. Um, the GDP outturn is also the fastest expansion recorded since 1976. On the supply side, Side, all the major production sectors registered positive growth, suggesting both based expansion despite the increasing international and domestic uh, commodity prices. This is led by services, which grew by 9.2%, followed by industry by 6.7%, and then agriculture by 0.5%. Um, as we expect a gloomy world economic outlook this year, we will remain vigilant and alert to ensure that the econ country will be resilient and on its path towards economic growth. To do this, the government is employing the following measures to ease inflation pressures over the near term. So um, the government uh, is working together with the Banco Central ng Pilipinas, uh, employing both monetary and non-monetary measures to help address our high inflation. Um, the, the BSP is expected to take further tightening measures in the early part of 2023 to curb uh, elevated inflationary pressures as upside risks to inflation continue to dominate the inflation outlook this year. Risks to inflation are primarily driven by high international food prices due to supply chain constraints and high fertilizer prices, trade restrictions, impact of weather disturbances to ag agricultural stocks, and potential transport for hikes and wage adjustments. The BSP is strongly committed to its price stability mandate. On the side of the government, the government ensures that its fiscal policy avoids adding up the aggregate demand that risks further inflation by maintaining fiscal discipline. The Philippine government remains committed to its fiscal consolidation path through the implementation of the medium-term fiscal framework. The government has intensified its measures to help improve local production and help the agricultural sector to rehabilitate and recover from the damages caused by recent typhoons. And it will also stand ready to do the same for the upcoming typhoons this year. 
In the interim, the government also implemented a temporary relaxation of trade restrictions to needed imports, such as the Executive Order Number 10, which extended the reduced most favored nation tariff rates of various commodities, particularly pork, corn, um, meat, uh, pork, corn, and rice. This is until December uh, 2023. And coal beyond 2023 provided that there will be a semester review of the reduced tariff rates after the aforementioned period. Um, also, the government enacted Executive Order 13, which allowed a two-year extension of reduced uh, tariff rates of mechanically deboned meat of chicken and turkey to ensure adequate supply at affordable prices. And also, uh, in November last year, the Department of Agriculture issued a certificate of necessity to import with a maximum importable volume of 25,000 metric tons effective November until January this year. Um, aside from that, the government also continues the provision of targeted transport, fertilizer, and fuel subsidies to affected and most vulnerable sectors to cushion the impact of in elevated inflationary pressures. Uh, crucial here is avoiding adding up to aggregate demand as this risks dialing up inflation. This can be done by providing targeted protection to those who are really in need while maintaining fiscal responsibility. In the Philippines, latest data indicates that the Department of Budget and Management has released a total of 12 billion for three programs. This includes 2 billion for the fuel subsidy program of the Department of Transportation, the 500 million for the fuel discount for farmers and fisher folk program of the Department of Agriculture, and about 9 billion for the targeted cash transfer program of the Department of Social Welfare and Development. Under the 2023 uh, General Appropriations Act, 510 million is allocated to the Department of Agriculture to fund the fuel discount of farmers and fisher folks. Another 3 billion is budgeted for fuel subsidy program under the Department of Transportation budget. And, but there's no specific item yet allotted for targeted cash transfers, but the government will continue its AYUDA program. We are also considering a prospective financing agreement with a, a Saudi fund for development specifically for the supply of urea fertilizer in um, 2023 to minimize prices. These measures are complemented by the continued linkages of farmers and fishers to consumers to ease prices through the Kadiwa ni Ani at Kita in Metro Manila and other areas. We know that this, the government still has a lot of work to do to improve this so that we will be able to reduce the supply uh, the, the to shorten the supply chain by uh, directly um, linking the farmers and fishermen uh, with the consumers. The government proactively conducts regular price monitoring activities and a supply demand forecasting to ensure efficient supply of key commodities, especially rice, meat, fish, vegetables, and sugar. As you know, um, our, our inflation rate was recorded at 8.7% for January, and uh, the government is currently working together, together with um, the Department of Finance, is coordinating with the Department of Agriculture, the National Economic and Development Authority, the Department of Trade and Industry, um, to get under the uh, presidential management staff to really discuss um, specific measures. We're currently looking at the each uh, point of the value chain to uh, the, to help really address this uh, the high inflation that we're currently facing. Equally important in the medium term are efforts to increase productivity and modernize the agriculture sector as laid out in the recently approved uh, Philippine Development Plan 2023 to 2028. This includes um, enhancing the efficiency of production of agriculture, fishers, and forestry through uh, diversifying farm and non-farm income, consolidating our clustering farms, and others, as well as um, access to markets and AFF-based enterprises um, to be expanded. Another is improving the resilience of the agricultural sector and the fisher sector value chains and also strengthening the agricultural institutions by improving coordination and convergence of government agencies in planning, programming, and budgeting, and enhancing support to agricultural education and job skills matching. As we 
as we expect investment expenditure to be a major thrust for the Philippines' road to economic growth and prosperity, the current administration will build on the accomplishments of the previous administration on infrastructure and further improve and modernize the country's infrastructure system to make it more integrated, sustainable, and resilient. We will continue the massive investment on infrastructure at about 5 to 6% of GDP annually. Over the medium term, our overarching objective is to build better more. Some of the priority areas of this administration is to enhance connectivity and resiliency of our infrastructure projects, provide a universal access to safe, affordable, and uh, sustainable water supply and sanitation services, uh, make our energy sector more competitive and sustainable, and improve our overall social infrastructures, especially in health, education, and waste management. Uh, the robust growth outlook will also be supported by the investment-ready policy environment strengthened by the calibrated reopening of the economy and shaped by historic enactment of game-changing structural reforms, as mentioned nga po ni Dr. Madi Kanina. These reforms include the Corporate Recovery and Tax Incentives for Enterprises Act, or CREATE, and amendments to the Public Service Act, uh, Retail Trade Liberalization Act, and Foreign Investments Act. Um, the administration is committed to establishing an even more competitive investment climate in the years to come by faithfully implementing these reforms. And of course, um, the economic team is working hard to ensure that our uh, ma that macroeconomic stability is sustained in our country because we know the importance of having a sound uh, macroeconomic fundamentals. Among the different uh, macroeconomic indicators, I think um, the, the country is performing quite well in terms for uh, particularly in terms of um, uh, in terms of financial system it remains strong uh, we have our lending growth is uh, growing double digit as mentioned a while ago by Maggie and also the non-performing loans has been around three percent which is um, one of the lowest since August 2020 it's lower than compared to 2020 August 2020 and it's also we also have a high capital adequacy ratio which is um, beyond the requirement of the Banco Central ng Pilipinas and the Bank for International Settlements. And aside from that, um, the, the fiscal position of the government is improving, which I will discuss uh, further later. So throughout the 19th Congress, we will continue to work with our partners in the Senate to push for key reforms crucial to accelerating economic development. This includes the rest of our comprehensive tax reform program measures, to improve the fiscal sustainability of our local government and other priority legislation. Three out of five BOF priority measures for 2023 have been approved in the House of Representatives. Uh, on November 14, House of, the House of Representatives has approved on third and final reading the following BOF measures. Uh, package 4, or the Passive Income and Financial Intermediary, Intermediary Taxation Act, the VAT on digital service providers, and the excise tax on single-use plastics. Um, all these bills are pending at the Senate committee level, except for the single-use plastic bill. And we assume that 70% collection efficiency for the revenue estimates. Um, in addition to the two other DOF priority measures are pending at the committee level in the House of Representatives, the real property valuation reform is still pending at the committee level in both houses. While the rationalization of the mining fiscal regime has been approved in the committee level in the House of Representatives. However, there's no fill, uh, filed bill yet in the Senate. We will further ensure that the economy is resilient by making sure that we remain committed in implementing the medium-term fiscal framework or the MTFF uh, as one of the priorities of the president mentioned during the SONA. This serves as our blueprint to reduce fiscal deficit, promote fiscal sustainability, and continue our robust economic growth. The MTFF will set the tone or will be our game plan for the next six years with due recognition of fiscal risks. The MTFF seeks to attain short-term macro fiscal stability while remaining supportive of the country's economic recovery and to promote medium-term fiscal sustainability. Uh, it also serves as a roadmap for developing a medium-term national government expenditure program. Among the targets set at the framework is the economy to expand by 65 to 7.5% in 2022. 
Um, for 2023, the target at the MTFF is at for a growth of 6.5 to 8 percent. But um, in December, the Development Budget Coordination Committee uh, approved their latest uh, growth assumption of 6 to 7 percent for 2023. It also aims to create more quality jobs and reduce poverty incidents by steering the economy back to its high growth path in the near term and sustaining inclusive and resilient path over the medium term. Our fiscal consolidation strategy will bring down our debt to GDP ratio from 60.9% in 2022, which is the actual data, to less than 16% by 2025. Um, in, our, in the MTFF, um, our commitment is to cut the deficit to GDP ratio from the current 6.4% to 3% by 2028. By the way, um, preliminary estimate uh, from, um, from the uh, Bureau of Treasury indicates that the fiscal deficit to GDP ratio could be at around 7.2%, uh, which is um, uh, much lower compared to the 7.6% uh, MTFF target. Um, you can see here the fiscal and consolidation path in the MTFF. Uh, as you can see, um, the, the target for 2022 uh, fiscal position is 7.6% of GDP. And the actual uh, based on preliminary estimate is around 7.2%. Um, uh, so it's much better. Well, for 2022, the debt to GDP ratio target is at 62%. And the actual is 60.9%. So it means that um, the government is really uh, serious in its con fiscal consolidation effort. And it also means that uh, the government has more fiscal space to be able to do what is needed, especially um, what uh, for this year that we're um, heading to a, a global um, uh, economic uh, deceleration. So the executive branch will closely coordinate with Congress to formulate and enact appropriate um, timely policy measures. We will expand the private sector's role in driving the transformation of our economy because they are really important. The government cannot do this alone. We ask, uh, as you know, in the past, the private sector really has a, um, a big role in, uh, in, in ensuring that our economy will uh, grow strongly, will remain resilient amid the global headwinds. Lastly, we will widen the space for civil society to turn the collective aspirations of the Filipino people into reality. Well, that ends my presentation. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Director um, Oliva, for your um, reactions and comments. So, okay. It is also noteworthy to hear the reactions and insights of, of the private sector. So for our second discussant, I am pleased to introduce to you uh, Mr. Raf Manalili, Malili, um, Manalili, an economist at the global market segment of the Bank of the Philippine Islands. As part of BPI's lead, econ um, lead economist team, um, as the BPI's lead economist uh he analyzes uh, macroeconomic trends affecting the financial markets and the bank's operations. And before his current role, he was a credit officer at the corporate banking division of uh, the Bank of the Philippine Islands. He obtained his master's degree in industrial economics from the University of Asia and the Pacific. Mr. Manalili, uh, the floor is now yours. Uh, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, before I begin, uh, I'd like to Thank the PIDS for the invitation. Uh, thank you for inviting BPI to this event. Now, uh, for my reaction, uh, first of all, the long-term prospects of the economy are good overall. Uh, we in BPI, we think that the economy will uh, continue to grow uh, in, in the coming years, not only this year, but also in the coming years. And that's because of our growth drivers, like, for example, household consumption, um, remittances, and then BPO revenues. And uh, these uh, growth drivers, they suffered or contracted during the pandemic, but now they have uh, recovered. Like, uh, for example, uh, household consumption, as uh, shown in this uh, slide, it fell uh, sharply during the pandemic, uh, but now it's back to pre-pandemic level or 2019 level. And then actually it's uh, higher by 4% versus uh, 2019 level. And then on the right side, we have here the consumer good imports. It's a proxy for demand. And right now, it's 16% higher compared to the pre-pandemic level. 
So definitely, uh, demand uh, has uh, improved a lot no, in, in the past year. And then uh, remittances, we continue to receive dollars from abroad. It uh, fell uh, marginally in 2020 by 0.8%, uh, uh, but now it's uh, growing again. So it grew by 5% in 2021. Then last year, 3% uh, growth. And this is good because it means that it continues to be a reliable source of income for uh, Filipinos. And it's something that will continue to drive the spending of uh, Filipinos. Now, uh, on the other hand, uh, there are headwinds affecting the Philippine economy, both uh, local and uh, global. Like, for example, uh, inflation. Uh, Dr. Gonzalez discussed this already a while ago. Uh, inflation has gone up significantly and it has a significant impact on the economy because we are a consumer-led or driven economy. So the impact on the economy is uh, significant. Then another headwind is the increase in interest rates. So uh, because of high inflation, central banks have hiked their interest rates aggressively. And that one, uh, it makes uh, the cost of financing, well, financing uh, projects and then uh, investing in hard assets like uh, equipment and factories, uh, they've uh, become more expensive. And it might uh, prevent the private sector from ramping up their uh, capital expenditures because of the increase in interest rates. Now, uh, considering all of these, uh, we expect the economy to grow by 5 to 6% uh, this year. Uh, specifically 5.4%. Uh, and this growth, uh, it's still uh, decent, although uh, it's uh, slower compared to what we had before, you know, before uh, COVID. And we can attribute this to the headwinds that I mentioned a while ago, specifically inflation. And speaking of inflation, uh, we expect a lower print for this year, 4.8% uh, on average. Uh, so we expect a decline in inflation, although the decline, most likely it will be uh, gradual or slow uh, because of the supply constraints, uh, persistent supply constraints, especially in the agricultural sector. Then for interest rates, we continue to expect rate hikes in the first half of the year because most likely inflation will remain high throughout the year. But then on at, uh, the second half of the year, the story could, could change depending on what will happen in the U.S. So for example, if a recession happens in the U.S., then it might force the Federal Reserve to cut their uh, interest rates. And if that happens, then the BSP will uh, likely follow with their own uh, rate cuts. So uh, overall, that's uh, out our outlook no, for the economy. So we expect the economy uh, to grow by 5 to 6%. So still uh, very decent, but uh, slower compared to before. Now, uh, aside from our outlook, I would also like to share with you uh, some of our observations on the economy in the past two years. So this is something that uh, maybe policymakers can uh, consider. And it's also a supplement to the recommendations uh, provided by Dr. Uh, Gonzalez in her uh, presentation uh, a while ago. So first, uh, as we all know, uh, the economy contracted by almost 10% uh, during COVID, during the pandemic. And if we compare this to our ASEAN neighbors, we actually had the biggest uh, economic contraction in the region. And uh, this chart, it's a visual representation of that. So it shows us the GDP of the country relative to 2019 and then relative to the other ASEAN countries. So there was a sharp decline in uh, during COVID, but now it's uh, back to the pre-pandemic level. Although it took us a longer period to go back to the pre-pandemic level. So it only happened in the third quarter of 2022. On the other hand, the other ASEAN uh, economies, they've managed to recover much faster. So they went back to the pre-pandemic level at an earlier time uh, compared to us. And there are several reasons that could explain this uh, disparity in uh, performance. But in our view, uh, one of the reasons is the structure of our economy. So uh, the Philippine economy, uh, it's a consumer-driven economy. We have a strong uh, consumer base. So it's an asset that has allowed us to grow by at least uh, 6% in the past decade. Uh, but then at the same time, it makes us uh, vulnerable uh, in the context of a pandemic because uh, when people stay at home uh, for quarantine, just like what we saw in the past two years, uh, the one that is uh, affected the most is household consumption. So it's very difficult to, to spend no, because of, of the lockdowns. And related to that, uh, this chart, it shows the percentage uh, share of household uh, consumption to 
the GDP of, of these ASEAN economies. And in the case of the Philippines, the uh, household consumption or consumer spending, it accounts for 70% of our economy. So it's the main driver of our, our growth in the economy. Meanwhile, for the other ASEAN economies, it's only 50 to 60%. So very clear that we are heavily reliant on uh, consumer spending. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the Philippines is also a service-led economy. The service sector is uh, very dominant. It uh, accounts for 60% of our economy. So it plays a huge role no, in, in the Philippine economy. On the other hand, the other ASEAN economies, the share is only uh, 50 per, around 50%. And we saw during the pandemic no, that uh, COVID had a significant impact on the services, services uh, industries. So because services, uh, usually they involve face-to-face -face transaction and it's difficult to implement uh, uh, social distancing no, in, in services. Meanwhile, for the other ASEAN economies, uh, they are res less reliant on consumption and services. Uh, instead, they have a strong uh, manufacturing base. So, uh, uh, like for example, uh, in the case of Vietnam, it has a strong uh, manufacturing base. So, these countries, they produce their goods, which they eventually uh, export to other countries. Like for example, the cars that we have here in the Philippines, we import them from uh, Thailand and Indonesia. And in the past year, there was a global uh, manufacturing boom you know, uh, because of the increase in the demand for uh, manufactured goods because people need to buy goods you know, to survive the, the pandemic. And uh, the other ASEAN countries, they've been able to ride on, on that boom. That's why they've uh, recovered much faster. So for example, in the case of Vietnam, the output of their manufacturing industry, it's 20% higher compared to pre-pandemic level. Uh, in Malaysia, it's 14%. Uh, in our case, it's only 3% despite the uh, a boost provided no, by uh, global demand. And for exports, it's the same. So uh, for the other ASEAN uh, economies, their exports, it's uh, 40 to 70% higher compared to pre-pandemic level. While us, no, we've uh, underperformed no, in, in terms of exports. So that's why they've been able to uh, recover much faster compared to us. Now, uh, basically, my point here is that we need to diversify our growth drivers. We need to uh, go beyond uh, household consumption and services in order for us to recover much faster and also for us to survive another pandemic if that happens. Because for the longest time, the economy has been uh, driven by uh, remittances, household consumption, and services. And it's good because these... Uh, Sources, these are very strong sources of growth. But uh, the pandemic has taught us that uh, we need to diversify. And actually, we can actually um, relate that to the depreciation of the peso uh, last year. So uh, the depreciation actually, it's like a symptom of, of that uh, problem that I'm discussing, the problem in our uh, structure, the structure of the economy. So as shown in the chart, uh, imports have grown significantly in the past two years. So last year, imports was around $137 billion. And our exports, remittances, and also our VPO revenues, the sum of that, uh, it's not enough no, to cover our imports. That's why the peso depreciated uh, sharply last year. It's one of the reasons why the peso weakened uh, sharply last year. And very clear here you know, that... Uh, we, we see the need no, to diversify our growth drivers no so that we can uh, so that uh, can have additional cushion no, in case an, another shock happens so di diversifying our growth drivers allows us to uh, grow even faster and at the same time it protects us from uh, shocks external shocks like the depreciation of the peso and also the the covid uh, pandemic and Basically, that's it. Uh, those are the insights that uh, I'd like to share with you this afternoon. So thank you again for uh, inviting BPI to this event and uh, looking forward to the discussion later uh, during Q&A. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Rachman Nalili of um, um, the, the BPI. Um, thank you for your forecast as well as your observations of the country's um, economic performance vis-a-vis -vis other countries' uh, performance. So we can um, unpack um, the um, 
the insights of uh you may have questions for him during the open forum okay so our last discussant is the secretary of the philippine chamber of commerce and industry mr ruben jimenez pascual uh, he has more than three decades of experience as a uh, journalist diplomat business executive and consultant as a businessman uh, mr pascual um organized and led a merger of two major export associations into the philippine exporters confederation as chief operating officer he is also the founder of rjp consulting which has provided services to international development agencies government agencies corporations business associations and so uh, social civic organizations he served the department of agriculture as an agriculture attache to the european union and was also an agriculture reporter of the now uh, defunct business day. Mr. Pascual has an economics degree from the University of the Philippines, Diliman. Mr. Pascual, sir, the floor is now yours. Thank you very much, Sheila. Magandang hapon po sa inyo lahat, Dr. Orbeta, the rest of the presenters, the government agencies represented here and other, uh, the academe and the private sector representatives. I will take a different. Uh, I will present a different take on on the discussions today. You know, the Philippine Chamber of Commerce and Industry is the largest business organization in the country. We are fully appreciative of the study made by PIDS in producing a comprehensive review of the macroeconomic picture for the country for the past year and the prospects for 2023. We note with optimism that PIDS, together with World Bank, the ADB, um, the IMF, and other economic institutions, still project the country's GDP to grow by around 7%, despite the external threats, such as the downturn in key global economies, such as the US, China, Europe, and the possible escalation of the Ukraine-Russian war. This optimism reflects the sound economic fundamentals the country is enjoying as it rebounds from the ravages wrought by the pandemic the last three years. We, in general, support the six policy recommendations put forward by the study team. Allow me to highlight some of them which are crucial for businessmen, especially for micro, small, and medium enterprises. First, controlling inflation. As the study indicated, this is a near-term priority uh, as high inflation not only tends to worsen poverty and income distribution, but also harms immediate economic recovery. Already, we are the country is facing surging inflation, reported to have peaked a few days ago at 8.7%, our highest in 14 years. And sad to say, this is just because part of that is the rise in prices of food, power, and rental costs. A very bad sign for a country aspiring to have sustained economic rebound. Worse, the inflationary push was caused by rising prices what? of basic food items, such as <laughs> eggs, onions, sugar, commodities which normally are in stable supplies in the country. The second recommendation is, uh, we're happy to note the uh, proposal to continue the policy moment, momentum on investments. We cheered the past administration with the passage of laws in 2021 and 2022 that cut corporate income tax and loosen restrictions to foreign investments, namely CREATE, Retail Trade Liberalization Act, the Foreign Investment Act, and the Public Service Act. It is our plea that the implementing rules and regulations of these IRRs be finished soon. Otherwise, sayang lang itong mga batas. Despite these efforts, 
uh, we cannot uh, we cannot just depend on this good news that the last administration presented because the regulatory environment for foreign investments remains still one of the most restricted in the region. The study correctly pointed that out based on UNTAD and the OECD regulatory restrictiveness index. Already foreign investors are discouraged in the country uh, because of inadequate infrastructure, expensive power, slow internet connectivity, regulatory inconsistencies, and corruption. We hope that as the president who is now in Japan continues to ramp up his foreign travels and lead the promotion of investments into the country, he will complement his work with loosening the regulatory environment for investments and addressing, addressing the nagging disincentives such as in, uh, expensive power, lack of internet connectivity, and corruption. Third, addressing the pandemic scars. One of the most heavily affected sectors by the pandemic are the, mid, uh, the micro, small, and medium enterprises, which suffered from shutdowns and business closures. It is little known by many that the MS, MSMEs was the largest hit during the pandemic. The MSMEs comprise 99% of all businesses and account for 70% of total employment. PCCI asked government to prioritize the recovery of small businesses to ensure the lo ensure the long-term growth potential of the country. It seems that MSMEs is not in the consciousness of many policymakers in the country. As the PIDS study focuses on the review of 2022 and the prospects for 2023, allow me to digress a bit from the current discussions and invite PIDS and other economic planners and the government in general to consider a new mindset in planning for the future of the Philippines. We normally use the lens of the Philippine Development Plan for a rolling five-year plan for a deep social and economic transformation. Just recently, NEDA presented its plan for 2023 for 2028. This year, PCCI will be holding our Philippine Business Conference this October and will banner the theme Vision 2050 towards a first world economy. We invite you, all of you, to use the lens not for this year or the next five years only, but for 2050, 27 years from today. It is the position of some PCCI leaders that the medium-term Philippine Development Plan is not vision-led. It is, again, short-term and opportunistic. As we prepare for this year's Philippine Business Conference, PCCI hopes to change our development narrative to that of aspiring to be a first world economy. Already this projection and conversation, uh, it may sound impossible for many, but it is in the conversation of key economic and business institutions. For instance, the Hong Kong Shanghai Bank King Corporation project the Philippines to be number 18 of the largest economies in the next 20 years. Capital economics, in fact, has a higher bar of number 16 among the world's top economies in the next 20 to 30 years. 
this optimism is mainly drawn from two distinct advantages of the country. The very rich natural resources. We are fourth largest in mineral resources. We are number three in copper. We are number one, four in gold. Not to mention the vast coastline that produces land and produce much more products for the country. The second advantage, and the world is talking about this, is the demographic sweet spot of the country. As we have one of the highest young working population in the world. There are over 70 million Filipinos between the working age of 25 and 70. And we graduate 800,000 to a million students a year, mostly with bachelor degrees. If we can only harness the natural and human resources of the country. Becoming a first world economy is not far-fetched. Stories of successful countries abound, notably Dubai, Singapore, Vietnam. Their formula is no secret. These countries opened up their economies with the liberalization of foreign investments and lowering of tariffs, constructed critical infrastructures such as airports, internet connectivity, and lowered the cost of power. These countries also invested in soft infrastructure to create a highly productive labor force equipped with skills for the global economy. Becoming a first world economy is doable if only we can put our acts together. But first, as a country, we have to decide we want to be a first world economy. We hope the ideas and other economic planners, especially those participating today, find time to dream with the business sector and study and lay out plans to make first world Philippines a reality. Magandang hapon po sa inyo lahat. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Pascual. Uh especially for your encouraging uh, remarks earlier during the, um, the, the poll, um, the poll that we had, um, more participants were hopeful that the economy will, um, will turn for the better by mid-year. And in your presentation, you mentioned uh, a number of reasons uh, for us to remain optimistic that uh, things will, you know, things will be better <laughs> uh, in the near term. Okay, so friends, um, at this point, let's uh, dive into the questions from our audience. I checked our um, Q&A box and I think there are, you know, a number of interesting questions. So yes, please uh, turn on your video so I can, so our uh, participants can see you. Thank you. So let me start with the first um, question. And I think this is directed to um, uh, the team, our PIDS team led by uh, Maggie. Okay. Um, okay. This, is, this one is from Maricel Solatare. Solatre. In your inflation forecast, what are the items that would fuel most of the price growth? Um, the inflation. How about... Yes. How about uh, for the food items? That was that was her question, Maggie. Oh, do you mean? Uh, meaning, would it continue? So I think we know where the ano uh, it's coming from, the famous like uh, onion, the vegetables. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> na onion ngayon. So, um, so when I say that there's gonna be elevated inflation, it's gonna be the same. I think stream, um, of items, and hopefully those will. Uh, soon come down uh, once the uh, measures mentioned by Tess uh, work their way uh, through. Mm -hmm. And as I mentioned earlier, if you look at global prices, pababae, eh, baba mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So, uh, so I think even the central bank uh, governor is looking at that, and, and we're just waiting for when it will pass through to our own prices. 
and it should happen soon, except nga the way nga we calculate it, it's year on year, and mm-hmm. it's average for the year. So mm-hmm. once you have an 8.6, sadly, <laughs> once you have an 8.6% in January, that if, if the so the month on month is important. So ang, ang aim ngayon is really the month on month pababain siya. Pababain siya, yes. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. so uh, again, I hope what Raf said that, uh, yeah, we had this in 2008. And actually, the reason mm-hmm. why we were able to go to near the tr- uh, the the band, target band, was because of a global recession in the GFC. So, we don't want that to happen. So, hopefully, we can contain it, uh, soft landing, if that can be applied, the term applied here. So yeah, so hopefully those items that may have had their prices escalating because of restrictions, mm-hmm. uh, I don't know, artificial restrictions, some would say, you know, all, all these stories about what, why we have, let's say, high onion prices. Um, hopefully those will be resolved. And yeah, so we could expect, as again, as I said, again, we, we hope uh, this will go down by the mid-year, by okay. mid-year. Yes. Thank you, Maggie. Um, actually, there's another uh, question for you, and this one is from um, Andre Teacher Estanislao of the Department of Foreign Affairs. Um, okay. In your presentation, household industrial in production loan in 2022 continue to rise despite yeah. tightening monetary policy and yeah. increase in interest yeah. rates to combat yeah. inflation. Will this increase in this loan signal an increase in consumption? Do you think that this increase in both loan and consumption is contributory to inflation? If so, should the government uh, pursue further tightening of monetary policy? Oh, that's a, <laughs> that's a hard uh, question. Um, so yeah, so uh, yeah, uh, loans have been recovering. So it means there's uh, fuel for future mm-hmm. growth. Um, should the the central bank tighten uh, their monetary policy in response? Um, hmm. uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> it's hard to answer that. I think I should let the BSP. But if I were, uh, because uh, the source of uh, it's supply side, right? The sub, uh, supply side, uh, the source of inflation is really more on the supply side. Um, so that's a hard uh, pill that the government has to, uh, for us to swallow, if our inflation does go uh, go up, uh, go, up. Uh, go up, really go up, mm-hmm. then they will ha- really have no choice since we're an inflation targeting country, and uh, so they will have to tighten. Uh, I mean, and um, baka hindi kasi na alam ng marami na the way we bring down inflation is really it's aggregate demand ang pinapababa natin. So it's really uh, for inflation to go down, you're really slowing the economy. Ganun lang ka simple yun. Sinaslow mo talaga yung economy. So ayaw nga natin yun mangyari, di ba? Kasi yes. gusto natin tuloy-tuloy ang growth. Tuloy-tuloy. So it, it's gonna mm-hmm. be a hard call. It's, it's gonna be, and I trust that BSB has been doing it for a long time. So they would know what to do and when to do it. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, I meron lang akong ano, isising it. Kasi sure, Mr. Sure. Pascual, <laughs> si Mr. Pascual, if he doesn't remember me, I'm Maggie Dibuque from, from Business World and Inquirer. And it, did I like, just Mr. Pascual uh, took me into his office uh, at uh, former, uh, <laughs> sorry, I'm sorry, I couldn't resist, former um, senator, baka pagalado, you remember. I worked for them for two weeks. Two weeks. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yeah, sorry, Mommy. Like, okay, so yeah, so yeah, just to lighten the mood. Okay. <laughs> 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 okay. <laughs> okay. Oo, matindi yung mga tanong. So let us uh, give Maggie um a break for now. Okay, yeah. let's go to another question in this time. Um other uh, members of the panel may want to uh, intervene. Sir, would you like to say something, Sir uh, Sir Robin? Please yes. go ahead. Uh, I'd like to comment on the onion issue. Yes. <laughs> uh, kasi uh, sabi ni Dr. Maggie na bababa naman, naka-function, maybe the world price of onion will go down. You know, the high price of onion in the country has nothing to do with the world supply. Uh, sir, there sa oil, oil po. 
sa oil pero oil, not I'm saying onion. oil and cereals po uh, onions, <laughs> no not onion onion, onion is domestic <laughs> domestic <laughs> yes so I don't know the composition of the increase in in pero maliit lang naman siguro ang onion so oh. but it really just go, went really sky really no I don't want to say sky really so, high symbolically <laughs> lang malaki kasi na hot seat ako eh <laughs> symbolically malaki kasi onion nga na basic na gamit na Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. okay. Thank you very much, Sir Ben. Let's go to another question. We have one here from uh, uh, Mr. Novel Bangsal uh, of uh, the CTBRD. And this one is um, regarding our foreign direct investments. Okay. Here is his question Would you say that lowering the F- FDI regulatory restrictiveness index would increase FDI inflow to the Philippines? If, if so, would you say that amending the economic restrictions in the 1987 constitution helped make the Philippines more competitive vis-a-vis ASEAN 5 countries in attracting FDI? Incidentally, this was this was also the question of Joseph um, Solis of uh, the Cebu Technological University. Okay. Um, since Mr. Pasqual, would you like to um uh, take a crack on this question? <laughs> And then yeah. I, can all, I can call the rest of the uh, panelists. Yeah. Normally, private sector is in support of uh, amendments to the Constitution, especially for uh, the economic provisions. However, um, we have changed our position a bit because we, have, uh, we were able to get have passed before major uh, laws, no? Create, um retail trade investments yung yung apat na na mention yung kanina uh, further amendments now ang nakakatakot lang diyan because the changes in economic provisions becomes an excuse for tinkering with the institution this is where private sector is afraid once you start tinkering and opening it no gagalaw na iba itong for the other self-interest uh, uh, provision. So we are very careful here. Uh, I think we'd like to address it according by specific provision to specific provision. Remember about two years ago, we were introduced uh, to uh, to the proposed amendment. Uh, not otherwise, uh, what do you call that? <laughs> Yung pwede mong i-amend basta, uh, basta hindi na banggit. So very dangerous if we allow certain sectors to take advantage of that. Thanks, Section uh, Pascual. Uh, uh, Sir Ra, Mr. Manalili, uh, we have, uh, would you would you like to share your thoughts on this? Uh, for investments, well, infrastructure is uh, crucial. It's actually the main component that we need in order to attract more investments. Because uh, businessmen, the number one concern is cost, of course. You need to reduce the cost of producing goods. And in order to do that, we need to improve our uh, infrastructure. Uh, uh, we, need, we need to, uh, especially in the energy, because we have one of the highest uh, electricity rates in, in the region. Then also the cost of transportation. And I think it's uh, feasible no? uh, for, for us to improve on that. Thank you very much. Um, okay, Director Oliva, uh, would you have any thoughts to share? I agree that um, based on the past uh, uh, competitiveness report, um, they mentioned that infrastructure is one of the uh, main reasons why foreign investments are not going into the country. Um, we, ha- we have very, uh, our infrastructure is quite uh, poor in terms of quantity and quality. And that is the reason why the administration is really focusing on infrastructure development. Um, the past administration made a uh, significant uh, development on infrastructure, but we deem that there's still a lot more things to do, particularly when it comes to uh, energy, as mentioned, because we still have w- one of the highest costs of electricity um, and also um the, the the internet connection in our country is quite low low and um 
if we are uh, banking on business process outsourcing, um, we really need to invest in improving our uh, our internet connection, particularly as a uh, as um, um market is going towards more on digitalization. So we agree that it's really on infrastructure and um, the the past uh, the recent um, liberalization measures on foreign um, ownership could help, but um, infrastructure is really the main main um, main solution. Infrastructure development. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Director Oliva. Um, there is another question for you here. This one is uh, really directed to you from. Uh, also from um, Executive Director Novel Bangsal of the CTBRD. Is there fiscal space within the medium term to spend 5 to 6% of the GDP to infrastructure? Will this increase spending? Will this increased spending be sourced entirely from the GAA? And how will this impact on fiscal projections? Uh, for example, deficit and debt to the GDP in the medium term fiscal framework? Well, um... I'm glad uh, he asked about that. Um, in the medium term fiscal framework, we indicated the fiscal path, fiscal consolidation path. And in the expenditure uh, portion, it already incorporated the 5 to 6% uh, infrastructure to GDP uh, spending of the government. But of course, um, the government would like to use these resources, but um, it is also encouraging the private sector to help in the infrastructure development. So so that the government will have more resources for other social development purposes. So um, in, by, by allowing the private sector or by through joint ventures, some of the resources will be freed up so that we'll have uh, we can do other infrastructure because we have we have due to budget constraint we have to prioritize if some of the resources will be freed up it will help in uh, addressing other infrastructure needs and other social development needs but um in the medium term fiscal framework the 5 to 6% of gdp infrastructure spending is already incorporated already thank incorporated. you okay thank you very much uh, director oliva okay another question here this time is uh, for you, uh, Mr. Manalili, uh, Raf uh, from Andrew Cesare Mando. Well, in your presentation a while ago, you mentioned about the need to diversify the economy, uh, to uh, diversify our growth drivers. Um, okay, do you think that one of the reasons why we have high imports, imports is because we fail to produce our own needs, especially in agriculture, where we import even salt? What do you think should be done to make our agriculture production better? Any thought? Well, yeah. yeah, actually, our uh, based on our analysis, our population is growing at a faster rate compared to the agriculture industry. Like, for example, since 2010, the population has grown by 22%, while the agriculture industry, it's only 19%. So for that period. And, well, I'm not an agri expert, but maybe one of the solutions is uh, economies of scale. So right now, kasi, uh, the agri-industry, it's kind of fragmented, so medyo kanya-kanya. And maybe we need to find a way for to consolidate no, the, the sector, to make to find a way for, for the different uh, groups to, to work together. Because right now, nga, medyo fragmented yung agri-industry. And we need to find a way to achieve uh, economies of scale in order to uh, increase our uh, productivity. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Raf. Okay, uh, I'm I'm looking at uh, the rest of the questions. Well, we have a um, good question here, and this one is about the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, uh, which, as you all know, is still being deliberated in the Senate. Um, well, uh, the question is. Will it be beneficial uh, for the for the Philippines? And there's one answer here from um, Dr. Rovellano Brion is our uh, in-house agricultural policy expert. And he says that uh, one of, uh, okay, I'm afraid I am less sanguine about investment outlook for the country compared with government analysis. Two things, the failure to issue the IIR of the PSA, and second, the failure to ratify the RCEP. These omissions suggest to make the lower end of your forecast uh, <laughs> is more likely. So, tama yung forecast natin. 
Any any thoughts, Maggie? Please. Uh, yeah. Uh, if you have any also regarding the the RCEP, which so, yeah. until now hasn't been, you know. So I, I try not to be, <laughs> I try not to be you know as as negative as I can be. Um, mm. but, uh, yeah, but it it will show in my writing what my inclinations are. So really, um, if you can read the report, uh, mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, uh, so they're inputting already for the create and for for the the liberalization bills. It's as I as I said, our own our my I'm sharing it with bids. I think uh, it's really more uh, grounded to reality that yes, the 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 missing pieces, as mentioned by both Dr. Ruel and uh, Sir Ruben, are still there, and they have to be. Uh, yeah, they maybe be start issuing that IRR. All the things that are needed to really make the the you know to produce the outputs that the bill was intended for. For RCEP, I'd like to just any you know uh, joining these trade agreements, uh, uh, these uh, associations. Mm -hmm. um, um, I'd like to link it with the vision of um, Raf and Mr. Pasqual that really, if our vision is you know a higher growth path, I th I also uh, mentioned it in the context of scarring, and I said mm -hmm. new areas have to. Uh, open and it isn't really true actually for now because of the pandemic except it's more important now because some parts have been scarred and it's more important that you have new areas of growth so his rough saying new drivers is really my way of saying also new areas which is also Mr. Pasquale's vision of a you know a, a, a world yeah. class world higher class. growth you know mm -hmm. um, economy and so I think that has to change our mindset. <laughs> we uh, we've we missed that boat, kasi for ilang ano na. We missed mm -hmm. that boat. Our neighbors were all outward looking, and they all wanted to export to the world, and you know to to raise their growth through the export uh, path. Uh, so we didn't uh, we didn't uh, we weren't part of that. Mm -hmm. And I hope it's not too late. And I think one way to 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 still tr go through that, you know. Uh, through through that path is to join uh, whatever uh, can uh, help us fulfill that vision. Because it's important that it's our mindset of you know we we should now this is not our only market. There's a bigger market right. out there that mm -hmm. we can tap. Mm -hmm. uh, Sheila, okay. may may I yes. add? Yes. Uh, Actually, sir, I was about to call you because I'd like <laughs> to hear the, your insights on the RCEP, sir. Yeah, uh, this is very disappointing. I thought Senate was going to already uh, start ratifying it. However, they uh, it was election year, and uh, they were they gave in to the agricultural lobby, to the farmers lobby. Um, unfortunately, I don't know who the farmers are here in this group, but they are hitting themselves or hurting themselves, you know. By really continue to be having a mindset of a protectionist, that is the situation in our sugar. No? Uh, we've been protecting our uh, sugar producers uh, to the point that we're running out of even sugar and heating the very exporters who are using sugar to create the higher value products. No? And here, uh, our legislators want to believe that by not joining RCEP, we will be protecting our farmers. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, we are really losing out. I can, mm -hmm. uh, you can imagine that RCEP, I think, is the second largest uh, 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 world co played uh, community already. And the rest of the countries, the members, can enjoy the lower tariffs by the mm -hmm. I cannot imagine us competing with plus five, plus ten tariffs. We will we will really be at a disadvantage. I hope we that's why I as I mentioned earlier, this is a mindset, Sheila. We need to change that mindset of the country mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to somebody, a country that really competes in the world. Mm -hmm. And we are really capable. Mm -hmm. Especially with uh, equipping our youth, hindi tayo dapat natatakot. We have all the human resources to compete in the world. 
Thank you very much, um, Sir Robin. Uh, we have audience from um, the legislative uh, branch, so I hope Thank they are listening. Okay, Sir, uh, Ma'am, um, Director Aliva, please go ahead. Uh, if I may also add on our step, I'd just like to inform everyone that um, the government is working with the Senate committee. There's this particular uh, technical working group. Um, kasi, um, the government and the Senate, I think they they recognize, even the agriculture sector recognize the benefits, the possible benefits of our step. But there, um, there's the, this fear that the country, the, the uh, particularly the agriculture sector, is not ready with RCEP. That is why in that technical working group, they are um, form formulating specific actions to ensure that the agriculture sector will be uh, more ready with the with the possible um, uh, influx of um, more resources and that uh, to ensure that our, our sector will be competitive, would be able to to produce um, products that are at par with with our world uh, world class products. So I think um, the the government is currently is just ensuring that we are ready, but we are open and we we recognize its importance. Um, and uh, based on the um, analysis of the economic team, um, the RCEP could provide a number of um, benefits. For instance, it could help improve increase access to finance, improve competitiveness mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. it, it it involves increased equity foreign equity participation that could boost capitalization. And of course, you know, as you know, FDI could provide uh, technology management skills and and so forth. And it could also help improve the, uh, domestic financial infrastructure. Um, that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Director Eliba. Uh, yes, yeah, those, those are like very important add, points. Please, please I'm go sorry. ahead. I'd just like to add that the expert for, for the PIDS for, for trade-related matters is Dr. Kimba. So if yes. he's around, he could maybe... Francis, are you around? <laughs> and also, so, yeah. I think Dr. Briones is also watching. Yes. Um, yes. Feel free, Roel, to um, send and us of course, a, Roel, for a message you know, for Agri. It's Roel, no? if you want your voice to be heard in this forum. <laughs> Yes, we would uh, be very pleased to to uh, to have you part, uh, be part of the panel. Yeah. I used to be actually an agriculture economist uh, going <laughs> back in history. Yeah, I worked with, uh, yeah, yeah, with, uh, yeah. I worked in that area. And so um, my comment only, since I am more financial macro uh, now, mm -hmm. is really, uh, um, so I hope that it's true that, uh, I mean, I hope uh things go well in that area, as Tess mm -mm. has said, because it's really um, something that should, there should be more uh, development now in that area. And That's hopefully, right. yeah, because yeah, I was working on that area in the 1990s, uh, 2000s. So, um, um, and it's still the same set of issues. And uh, hopefully, this time, uh, I guess my two cents worth there as a macroeconomist is this time that the sectoral issues really get addressed and uh, we are able to equip. So we don't want to sound callous naman, uh, towards mm -hmm. the agricultural sector. I hope yes. that that isn't how uh, it sounds to them. Uh, we do uh, understand that, uh, yeah, it's it's an effort, a Herculean effort for the sector, and they will need the the they will need some a lot of support from their government, mm -hmm. and so I yeah I hope they do um, settle the issues there, and uh, again it's really part and parcel of us leveling up. Uh, mm -hmm. That's uh, right. Mm -hmm. in, in terms in the of agriculture. Of our that's right. In terms of agriculture, we can we can view the RCEP as an opportunity for the agri sector yes. to fast track its yes. modernization. No? Yeah. So <laughs> <laughs> what will happen to the country if we, we always, you know, um, let fear overtake, I mean, let fear uh, dampen our development, this, uh, this unfounded fears. Anyway, uh, as you said, we don't want to sound callous to the agricultural sector. We recognize, we acknowledge their uh, concerns as well. So we are hopeful that the RCEP will have, <laughs> we will hear good news about uh, the ratification of the RCEP. We are keeping our fingers crossed. 
and and thank you to all of you for your for for sharing your insights on on this topic. But we're not done yet because we still have a number of, of questions. Okay, and this one, let me, this one is about importation, if I may touch on this topic. Okay, from, from Kyle Jarry, there is Senate deliberation in importations, and it seems that they are not happy with this since monetary tightening is a double-edged sword and is at 5%. Uh, do we have other ways to control prices of goods other than importation? Um, and another um question related to importation lately uh, from Joshua Araba. Lately, our government relied on the importation of some basic commodities to put a halt to the increasing prices. Does importation help or does it worsen instead of our economy? Does it worsen instead of our economy? Well, um, basic economic questions. <laughs> Maggie, would you like to answer are they, this? Are they talking about importation of agriculture items? I think so. Uh, basic commodities. And, and I, the question is, is there another way of bringing down? Yes. Um, yes. Is there another way, way of, of bringing down inflation? Is there another, yes, yes. So, uh, I just like... <laughs> Okay, is so, there another way of controlling prices other than importation? Yun. Um, so yeah, so I guess this is part of basic macro education. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sadly, me? that's why they always say bitter pill, diba. Um, so yeah, one way is really so rem remember your aggregate demand and your aggregate supply. Okay, so the way you bring down prices is really to bring down aggregate demand, and you do that by raising interest rates, contracting spending, you know, monetary tightening. Uh, what have you. Um, you can go, you know, raising taxation. And that's not something that, that, right? And the, now they're saying on, on other ways to, is to actually raise uh, taxes. And so we don't, uh, that's not in our tool set. What is in the tool set of the monetary authority is really what it has now, uh, which is really um, either, uh, it, it, it's to tighten monetary policy, which is to raise the, the, the policy rate. And that's the um, tool set. Um, you could also go through the reserve requirement. And I guess the banks would, of course, not want that um, because that would raise the cost of uh, intermediation. Okay, so the reason why the government uh, is turning to, to the supply side. Okay, so aggregate demand, as I said, it's really, you're bringing down aggregate demand. So you're bringing down growth, essentially. Ganun lang siya kasimple. You're actually bringing down growth. Mm -hmm. mo na kundi yung growth. So the other way is to, is to raise uh, aggregate supply. And how do you raise it in the short term? Well, we're saying there are lots of things we can probably do to raise long-term productivity, with, which would bring down prices in the long term. Matagal pa yun, like education, mm -hmm. you know, um, human capital technology, investment, yeah, all of that. Um, oh yeah, all of these investments that will raise productivity. Mm -hmm. Pero matagal yon. If you want to mm -hmm. bring it down now, ano yung pinakamabilis on the supply mm -hmm. side na pwede mong galawin? And unfortunately, mm -hmm. or fortunately, you know, it's it, it's really the restrictions that we have the tariffs that so it's temporary right, right that's it's really temporary bring temporarily bringing down tariffs and what the ideally what what is ideal is really yung adding agriculture you know uh, people in charge of agricultural culture know when to time this right that's i think right. dr mm -hmm. Briones is, is in uh, in, in better, better position, position. Like, but it really you have to know the timing Okay, mm -hmm. so it's not, it's not, you know, it's not not rocket science. Mahirap din siya because mm -hmm. you have to do forecasting, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So mm -hmm. yeah, so that's why it's temporary bringing down the tariffs, uh, and hopefully, tama yung timing mo na hindi mo naman na ano yung farmer. I mean, it's it's proper timing of uh, when and by how much you do it. But yeah, mm -hmm. but that's one way, kasi really to bring down, and it worked, kasi that the point is it has worked. It has worked in Calamia 20, uh, two years ago. Um, uh, so remember, uh, Tinari Feynman yung, yung rise. It was the rice tariffication mm. law. And then we had the EOs that lowered the tariffs on meat. meat and yeah. uh, yeah, diba yung, when the African swine fever happened, That's right. and they had several EOs. Then during the mm -hmm. Ukraine war, when it was the mm -hmm. Syrian crisis, et cetera, and fuel, they now lowered the tariffs uh, on, on those, uh, on I think, uh, um several items corn right is it corn and uh 
Yeah, Tess would know yeah. which ones. Rice, rice, corn, pork, and coal. Coal. So rice, these are the yeah. corn. So to bring, because yeah, because yun yun natamaan ng Ukraine na uh, Russian conflict, uh-huh. and so mm-hmm. in extent. It's just being extended. Hindi naman siya permanent. It's just being extended. Okay, okay. so it's really a, a measure to to just bring down because we don't want runaway prices. You know, man, yung mm-hmm. sa I mean, let's also uh, be appreciative of because pag nag runaway prices na yan, yung what they call, you know, like I don't want to say hyperinflation, pero pag mataas na mataas na, mahirap siya pababain. Mm-hmm, so mm-hmm, we want uh, mm-hmm. yun yun so yeah so I guess uh, yeah yeah it's uh, really hard you... balancing act no Maggie? yes yes it yeah, is yeah. Uh, so mm-hmm. yeah it's very difficult job actually. yes okay okay would uh, our other panelists have anything to say regarding this topic or we can okay let's jump to another um, question because it's already for 10 and this one is again for you uh, Tess uh Again, from Dr. Novel Bangsal of the CPBRD, the IMF recommended to increase the pace of fiscal consolidation so that deficit targets will be achieved in shorter term and create more fiscal, fiscal space so that we can grow much faster and higher. Does the DOF intend to follow the IMF prescription or just maintain the fiscal trajectory as indicated in the uh, MTFF? Well, uh, the DOF uh, it tends to follow the MTFF because uh, while we wanted to have a uh, while we want to be committed to the fiscal consolidation path, the government also wants to support economic uh, uh, recovery, especially now in 2023. There's a global economic slowdown, so there's really a need for the government to help the the the, the domestic economy to ensure that we will not go into a recession. So um, we think that. Uh, we should not be uh, uh, speeding up the fiscal consolidation. So we're just uh, doing it slowly so that while we are uh, doing the, we are uh, going towards the 3% fiscal deficit by 2028, we are also providing support through infrastructure development and social development uh, expense spending. Okay. okay. Thank you very much, um, Tess. Okay. We have... A really interesting uh, question here from uh, one of our Facebook uh, viewers. No, actually, I've been anticipating this question for <laughs> some time <laughs> now. <laughs> what are your thoughts on? Um, okay, um, because I'd like to uh, mention the the name of the the person who has this. Okay, from Mari Del Cons- Consui. What are your thoughts on the Maharlika um, investment fund? And will do you think it will spur the economy or not? Okay, uh, as you know, this the, the Maharlika investment fund is one of the uh, contentious topics in the policy sphere. So would like to take a crack at this question. Uh, Raf, would you like to... Um, Answer this first, so that I can I can proceed to the rest of the uh, uh, panel members, please. Yeah, um, well, I'm not really familiar with the details of of the bill, so I can't uh, comment specifically on that. But mm-hmm. siguro what I can say na lang is, it's good that we are looking for ways to uh, finance our uh, uh, expenditures, especially in infrastructure and. Uh, yeah, it's something that we need to work on. No? Uh, finding more ways for us to uh, increase, no, or to finding more ways for us to fund no, our uh, infrastructure uh, projects. Although I can't uh, comment uh, specifically on on that uh, proposal. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay. Um. Thank you for that, Ralph. Um. Okay. So, second gen, uh, Ruben. Any thoughts? On the Moharlika Investment Fund? Medyo controversial na issue. Uh, we, okay, now let me speak per, on a personal level. At a Sige po. Okay. Ako, depende kung saan gagastusin. There are two issues. Eh. Saan manggagaling yung gagastusin? Saan manggagaling? I think this is, there are, they have to resolve that already. I think uh, Secretary Jokno 
did present that to the Senate. And the Senate is convinced that there's enough money to use. Hindi na yung mga pension ng ordinary mm-hmm. tao na gagamitin. So may, may paggagamitan na, I don't know, maybe the government council. So that's uh, that's a thorn out of the of the debate. No? The second is, what do you use it? So I really believe there has to be a very special investment on very critical infrastructure. Halimbawa, in Dubai, nagsimula yan, walang pera yan. Eh. Nang hiram lang sa Abu Dhabi ng pera yan. About 30, 40, 35 years ago. Ang pinaganda nila, airport. That was the single infrastructure that they started with one infrastructure. That was the beginning and, and the rest is history. So sa Pilipinas, I think we need to resolve which infrastructure project kung isa o dalawa na funding. Nasa tingin natin mangyayari, if you ask me, it should be the, the paglatag ng internet all over the country because the benefits cuts across uh, uh, economic sectors. And hindi lang economic, pati social, edukasyon. In other countries, it is govern, their government who invest in, in, who did the digital infrastructure. For instance, Korea. Sila naglatag. But here in the Philippines, we are hoping that smart and globe will do it for us. Of course not. But there are mercenary areas that will not spend and suck subsidize for everybody. So who's going to do that? It has to be government and maybe an investment tool like Maharika can be the one that can be used for such things. Mm-hmm. Okay. Thank you very much, Section uh, Pascual. No? So very important points. How the fund will be used? Where, where will it be used? No? Um, Maggie, uh, you have something to, to say about uh, this topic? No, I think, and, and you said that you're preparing a policy note, no? Yeah. So, yeah, on, I'm on actually preparing a policy note on this. So, I don't really, um, I haven't, uh, I mean, I want to look at all the issues uh, first. Kasi hindi naman siya simple. It, it's, uh, it has so many facets. And actually, I just, I started reading the history on SWFs and SI, I mean, I mean it's really just SWFs. Um, they're all SWFs, um, and it's really uh, it has been evolving. Okay, I have mm-hmm. to grant that it has been evolving. So granted that, uh, so there's the argument about that you cannot build it on a, on a deficit. So that really used mm-hmm. to be the case because it really was an uh, an avenue for people for sorry for economies that had current account surpluses, whether through mm-hmm. natural resources or whether through just really having current account surpluses. And it, it, it came part and parcel with actually with macro management. Okay? It helped in the macro management. Now that is if you have surpluses. Now, uh, now there has been a new breed of F- SWFs. I think I heard it, uh, NT Leia, Natural, National Treasury Leia also talked about it, about there being an evolution. So there, it's true that there is an evolution, but Every evolution also has a rationale. Okay, so why, how come they were able to, uh, if you will, I haven't uh, completely reviewed it, but really these countries that were able to build on a deficit had something, they still had a source of wealth. So they either had uh, privatizable assets, assets that can be privatized. They had like Vietnam had profitable state owned. So all these things. So I, what I can share now is really, the principles, okay, I, I said I had Please. the principles. It's really, they really have to clarify the objectives of the fund. Mm-hmm. What is the fund going to look like exactly? How is it going to be invested? Like Mr. Uh, Pascual said, because you cannot have a Swiss knife approach. I think that is basic. You cannot have a Swiss knife approach. You have to decide, is this for a short-term gain? Is this for a short-term financial gain? Is it for long-term development, like building that backbone? They have to decide. Um, and then they have to, yeah, to to design or tailor 
uh, the fund based on, on the objective. Number two, again, as I agree with Mr. Pascual, it's the source of funding. Saan yung kukunin? Right. Uh, mm-hmm. My concern is if it's going to be a scramble for internal resources, meaning mag-aagawan pa tayo ng internal resources, that's going to be very contentious. It's mm-hmm. going to be hard, especially where, you know, we're in a deficit and we have high debt. It's, it's parang mag-aagawan pa tayo. So I, what, what could be very positive if that fund could be used to bring in new resources? new FDI, new capital. If, it, if kung sabihin na investor, if you build that fund, I'll, I'm going to come in. Yes. Then, of course, mm-hmm. I, will, I will join in embracing that fund. So I think this is most important uh, as regards the impact on the fiscal picture, growth, and debt. I think another question is, why not PPP? Okay, so I think that's a question. I won't answer it. I don't. I, I haven't uh, thought about it. But that, to me, is a question. Why not PPP? So, uh, those who are originating the fund have to know, have to tell us why not PPP. And mm-hmm. the, I think the point made by Milken Institute, I also agree with it. They said an imperative is for there to be buy-in from the private sector. Okay, indeed, padding away away. I mean, we we can't be bickering over this at this time. That's why I say it's eye on the ball. Let's get together and you know go through this together. But uh, how is it going to affect the texture and the relationship of business sector and government? Okay, and mm-hmm. it's important to have buy-in from them because they're That's the right. ones moving the economy. And then, mm-hmm. hindi ko napag-usapan yung governance, but clearly that's important. That's a whole conversation all together. Conversation all together. Yes. Yes. Ibang webinar mm-hmm. yon. <laughs> <laughs> we can have a webinar on the MIF, no? Once your policy note is out, no? <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you, Maggie. And I think Tess, uh, Director Olivia, has you know, something, something to say as well. Please. Mm-hmm. Um, the government uh, supports the uh, establishment of the Maharlika Investment Fund um, mainly because it could serve as another source for infrastructure development. And um, uh, Ma- Ma- Maggie mentioned about the NG fiscal deficit. Um, uh, we're looking at the, the the government, the consolidated public sector financial position. And while the government is in, the national government is in deficit, there's some certain institutions of the government that are in surplus. That's mm-hmm. why um, the, they're sourcing some of the funds from the GFIs or the government financial institutions, particularly the Land Bank of the Philippines and the Development Bank of the Philippines, because they have these investable funds, which um, due to regulations, they're restricted from uh, investing in certain investment assets. So through the um, MIF, it gives them the opportunity to put mm-hmm. some of these uh, resources in the investment fund for um, more profitable types of investment. And um, so, so we, Director Oliva, in, in terms of fund sources, we're now we're looking at the GFIs, the government financial institutions. But yeah. uh, so the, the pension fund, the pension programs no, are no. already out of the picture, out, right? Yeah, out of the picture, yeah. So it's like, I think it's around 25 billion from the Development Bank of the Philippines and around a uh, 10 billion from the Land Bank of the Philippines, and some of the uh, funds will also be sourced from um, from the dividends that will be uh, given by the Banco Central ng Pilipinas for the government, and also um, other fa- sources, possible sources, the Pagcor, and um, sub- privatization of certain assets of the government, and we have an initial list, and we're still um, studying it uh, to ensure that um, to know. Uh, w- what particular assets could be uh, privatized uh, during the time frame because we wanted to have the MIF um, be implemented as soon as possible so that uh, the government will have other sources of funding uh, for um, invest for the infrastructure development. I, I think um, the MIF, it's in, in the bill, it indicates that other possible investments include cash foreign currencies, metal and other tradable commodities, uh, fixed income instruments, domestic and foreign cor- corporate bonds. So it's like a, a portfolio of different investments. And one of that 
is on the other investment as a, a, approved by the board. And um, for the infrastructure development, we're ensuring that it will be based on the assessment of the National Economic and Development Authority to ensure that we're putting the resources to uh, infrastructure projects that have high returns and will be very beneficial to our country. And moving forward, we think if we if the government would be able to use the funds, uh, uh, if the MIF or the MIC, the Maharika Investment Corporation, would be able to invest it in good infrastructure uh, projects, it could help in, uh, accelerate our economic growth and it could provide further resources for the government in terms of revenues in the future. And also if, there, if the MIF will be able to manage it properly, they will be earn a lot of, a number of, uh, uh, they will earn more income, which could serve as dividends and additional sources for the government. That is why we are supporting this initiative. Um, uh, but of course, it is very important that um, the, the, the funds will be uh, managed properly because that is why the government is working closely with the Senate, with the Senate, because to ensure that um, the bill is crafted and um, properly so that it can aid in accelerating the implementation of our uh, key infrastructure and big ticket projects. And aside from that, um, the bill also has some features because it, it tends to attract um, the, the, the experts in the financial field, but it also has some um, safety measures such as it will be a uh, uh, there will be internal, external audit, and uh, uh, commission and audit, um, and also there's this um, uh, oversight committee of Congress to ensure that it will be managed properly. So we uh, we believe that um, if it will be given the chance and if it will be managed properly, it has uh, it is a good um, economic accelerator to help our country. Uh, say, for instance, as mentioned by. Uh, by Sir uh, Sek Chen Rubin, um, one of the infrastructure uh, sector, uh, in one of the sectors that we're looking into is in, uh, infrastructure on um, inf internet connection to help improve the internet connection. Also on um, other, uh, uh, also for instance, in the development of ports like seaports and to help ensure uh, imp uh, that we improve our logistics and it could also help improve the, the lower inflation moving forward. So we're, we're, uh, the government is uh, really working hard and we're talking with other um, experts from other countries. We had a communication with the uh, people from Singapore and also from the private sector to determine uh, or their, their take on this um, proposal and uh, to gather some ideas so that um, the MIF that we will have will be really for the benefits of the Filipino people. So we hope that, uh, of course, it depends on the implementation. The bill is just one aspect and implementation is another aspect. And the government uh, uh, is committed to, uh, to, because it's the Department of Finance is a uh, part of the advisory body of the MIF based on the existing deal. So the government is uh, really wanted this to, to be successful so that, um, of course, we want to have a faster growth. As mentioned in our MTFF, we, we intend to have an upper middle income uh, economy in the future or the middle income economy. That's all. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much for those um update so uh well it's it's plenty um um explanation of uh, the current uh features of, of the bill not because it has really departed from the i i think there has been a, a big departure from the original um original proposal in the senate no so uh well we can have a another yeah, session another on this, webinar no? <laughs> another webinar on this because no? yeah, sure your Featuring yeah. your policy note, uh, Maggie, and perhaps, uh, you know, it, it, this will also serve, um, this will yeah, also help us help. understand more um, the uh, MIF, no? Because because the government is already selling this overseas, <laughs> right? Uh, the, mm -hmm. uh, right, uh, Dr. Uh, Director Des? Yeah. In, 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 various the... fora, in various fora overseas, yeah. no? 
Mm-hmm. Because um, we wanted also, like similar to Indonesia, foreign investors are also investing in Indonesia through their uh, sovereign wealth fund. So we also want to use yeah. MIF in the same way that it could attract uh, foreign investors so that it, um, it will provide more resources, particularly for infrastructure development. Okay. Thank you very much. I think we have um, covered uh, a lot of ground today. And uh, just to cap our discussion, may I ask our presenters for some brief parting words, if they have any. Uh, may we hear first from um, uh, Maggie, Dr. Dobuke, and then we, we can um, go to, our, to the rest of the panel. Maggie, please. Okay, just I just like to thank again our panelists. Um, thank you, Tess. So Tess and I worked together before, right? <laughs> so I know Tess very well, and of course, Mr. Robin. Uh, he was a former uh, mentor of sorts uh, when I was very young. Uh, and Ralph, thank you for for gracing our webinar. Um, uh, I also um, am a sucker for hope, for optimism. So I, <laughs> while I do have a low forecast, I am hoping for positive surprises. Um, That's right. Yeah, and for the Moharlika Fund, uh, yeah, I uh, I hope uh, there's still time uh, to further, you know, fine tune the fund. Because this is for everyone. Because even the president, he said, diba, sabi niya, we want, I want to get this right. Sabi niya, I want to get this right, not right away. Parang ganon. I, I, don't, I forgot the code. So I'm taking up on that. And uh, if he does want to get it right, then I hope that there will be more time for debate and consideration and, you know, fine-tuning the bill. So it really works for the Filipino people. I guess that's uh, my final uh, message. Thank you very much, Maggie. And also to your, to your team for that uh, uh, excellent uh, paper. And uh, well, we look forward to your um, other publications at the IDS and also in, in other um, organizations. Okay, let's now hear from um, EOF Director Marites Oliva, please. Well, uh, we would like to thank you again for inviting us. It's one of the discussions of an excellent paper of Doc Maggie. Um, we really uh, find it very useful in our work, particularly on policy formulation. And it now uh, we, ha- we have another source of forecasts because we're really <laughs> looking at the forecasts of different market analysts, multilaterals, so that uh, we will have better um, uh outlook or better uh, take on what could be could happen in the economy and to formulate the best policy to help ensure that we will be able to achieve our target. And um, thank you also for the opportunity to discuss some of the uh, um, uh, looming issues in our in our economy, including MIF. And uh, thank you so much for all the the um, uh, the presentations of my call discussions. Thank you. I learned a lot in this session. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much too, ma'am. We're really happy that uh, you're able to join us today. And uh, Mr. Uh, Raf uh, Manalili of uh, BPI. Uh, Raf, please. Uh, yes, uh, I'd like to take, thank this uh, opportunity to thank uh, PIDS once again. And uh, well, personally, I'm thankful also because uh, back in college and even until now, uh, the research papers produced by uh, PIDS have been uh, very helpful. It has, uh, the, the papers have allowed me to understand better the policies being implemented by the government and also the uh, different uh, issues no, in, in, in the economy. So thank you again for, for the invitation. Thank you. Thank you too, Ralph. Okay, of course, Last but definitely not the least, uh, Sekjen Ruben uh, Pascual of the uh, Philippine Chamber of Commerce and in- Industry, sir. Thank you, Sheila. Uh, I'd like to congratulate again Maggie and uh, her study team and thank Raf and Marites for joining me in discussing these things. The only thing I wanted to talk about, and this is something I will be talking about in other fora. We need to dream. I mean, we need to really have a vision. And this is something that has happened already in the past. One example, very quickly, is that the Philippines leading the disease, the overseas, uh, the Filipinos who man the ships globally, 
it did not happen overnight. It started with the vision of government and the private sector. And when they decide we will dominate the mining industry, schools were created, incentives were given, and the rest is history. This is something we need to start doing. That we make a decision, whether it's RCEP, whether it's digital connectivity, or taking advantage of our natural resources, or the demographic sweet spot. We have to start in a united vision. And I invite PIDS. Maybe, Maggie, you can start formulating something. This is different from the normal economics uh, work because you really have to function now. What does it take to have these kinds of growth rates to achieve um, mm -hmm. uh, to achieve that growth? Raming tanong dyan. But it can only be started if you study. I hope mm -hmm. you PIDS invest money to do that dreaming. Thank you mm -hmm. very much. And thank you very much to Secjen. No, uh, ending uh, this webinar with um, you know, those remarks of uh, optimism. You know, having you know, having that uh, that mindset that things will will really um turn out for for the better you know because we as a filipino we as a nation can can overcome whatever economic difficulties we're going through and all i think this is really a, a good way to end our webinar this afternoon so maggie meron kang mga uh, assignment <laughs> section okay anyway so thank you very much to all our guests friends please join me in thanking them for the wisdom they shared with us this afternoon Let, let's show our appreciation to our speakers through a big virtual clap and of course thank you to our audience for joining the discussion so earlier we had a webinar raffle uh for those of you who are not familiar with our webinar so every uh every time that we have this virtual event we uh draw uh, randomly um draw names from the list of our Zoom and uh, uh, Facebook participants. And so we also did the same for this webinar. So our webinar raffle winners for this uh, event are, okay, from Facebook, Maridel Konsuhi. Uh, and then from Zoom, uh, Raymond Tinon and Joseph Solid. Okay, so Maridel, Raymond, and Joseph, our webinar team will get in touch with you for the delivery of your prize. And finally, we have some reminders. You can access all the presentations from today's webinar on the PIDS uh, website. And also flash on the screen is the link to the full study of uh, Dr. Gonzalez and her team. Um, we will send you the link uh, through Facebook uh, as well. Also, please answer the feedback survey that will pop on your screen af after this webinar. Your comments are important for us to improve our virtual events. In addition, please regularly visit our website and follow us on Facebook and Twitter. We also have a YouTube channel where you can access the recordings of our events. Uh, for this month, we have two more uh, webinars in the coming weeks. Okay, um, On the 16th, we will feature a PIDS study that examined the Philippine road and rail transport infrastructure. And on the 23rd, we will talk about innovative data sources for addressing data gaps. And finally, we would uh, like to acknowledge the various organizations from the government, uh, academe, civil society, business, and international development community, also the media, okay, uh, for joining us today. Maraming salamat po. So friends, this concludes our virtual policy forum. Thank you for attending and see you again next week.